Um, to order. Uh, I'd like to welcome my colleagues and staff and uh, any of our uh, constituencies that are listening. We welcome you to do so. Uh, the first thing on the agenda uh, is approval of our minutes from the August 22nd meeting. Are there any requested changes, additions, or deletions to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Marshall. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Like sign, and that carries unanimously. Okay, we're going to move on to approval of VATI 2024 project agreements. That would be attachment number two in your handouts, and I will refer over to Mr. Sandy. All right, thank you so much. So uh, we talked about this last time, I think. We, we were successful in uh, a 2024 VATI application with uh, a, new, a new partner for us, uh, Zytel. They're a, a Bedford company. Uh, they did some, some fiber work in Bedford. They also attempted or, or made application for a project in Carroll County as well as here in Franklin. They were not successful with the Carroll application, but they uh, were successful with our application getting funded. And so we've been working with them in the state to kind of get us moving along and get us under contract. Um, so really what we need to do is, is two things. We, as the county, we sign a contract with the state for uh, the grant project. And then we also turn around and we have a project agreement with the ISP, the Internet Service Provider, which in this case is Zytel. And so for us, we have uh, two different contracts. And so in your packet is a copy of our contract with Zytel, uh, a draft copy that the county attorney's office has uh, gone over with me and the folks at Zytel have reviewed as well. Everybody's comfortable with this contract. Um, this is one of the pieces of information that the state is looking for us to provide uh, to them before they'll issue their contract with us. And so um, we're at a point where we're looking for the approval to go ahead and enter into this uh, contract with Zytel. And then subsequently, we'll also get that contract with the state, um, and we'll need to sign that as well. Looking for approval for both of those at this point. Uh, one of the, the time constraints may be our next meeting and the time that the state gets their contract wrapped up. The state contract, we really don't have a lot of flexibility with it. It kind of is what it is. And so looking for the permission to sign that, as well as the one that's in your packet, uh, the one that, that looks like this, which is with, with Zytel. And again, the county attorney's office has looked at this and reviewed it. Um, if you remember this one, um, we're, from a monetary uh, standpoint, we're, the county is only putting in $10,000 to this, this project, um, whereas the, the state is providing about $4.5 million and, and Zytel is putting in about $7.5 million. So substantial investments uh, on both sides uh, for these projects and this is about uh, 2,500 additional uh, sites that we're expecting to cover with this project still doesn't get us totally covered so we're still kind of chugging along picking picking off the households as we can the next step which I'll get to later is the bead process where we're that's the, the process where we're hoping to kind of get those last several thousand finally covered so I'll be happy to answer any questions. There are some sample motions um, in your uh, in your packet there if, if anyone is ready to, to make a motion for those. Okay, does any of the authority members have any questions for Mr. Sandy on the agreement with Zytel and DHCD? Any questions, comments? Okay, uh, you have a motion available for your reference in your packet, um, I will entertain a motion to approve or disapprove of the agreement as submitted. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, grant agreements with Zytel and Virginia DHCD and authorize the uh, authority chair and county attorney to sign the necessary documents to execute these agreements on behalf of Franklin County. Thank you, Mr. Tatum. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously. Mr. Sandy. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, I will note on the project with Zytel, we were able to also do a pre-authorization letter. I might have mentioned this at the last meeting mm -hmm. as well, where they could go ahead and start engineering uh, prior to having these awards in place, and so that's helped us kind of hopefully gain a month or so in the process. Yeah. Um, moving along. So. Um, so speaking of that and keeping projects moving along, the, the next kind of update is, is body 2022, uh, which is the Chantel project. And last, uh, last time we met, you had updates from Chantel um, as well as River Street. And we also had um, uh, Amanda Cox from American Electric Power here. Um, and we talked quite a bit about the make ready permitting process and just some of the struggles and the challenges there. That process is, uh, if I can simply just kind of describe that process is uh, our, our broadband project is basically adding additional wires to the poles, to the electric poles. Um, so adding another fiber wire like you would cable television or something. Each time one of those fibers touches a AEP pole, AEP has to review it and they have to approve it. Um, and so the number was over 10,000 poles in the county that were being touched. And so that is and continues to be kind of the the uh, struggle that we have with this project is, is getting through that process, getting those permits approved so Shintel can then get their crews out there to actually do installation um, and get folks connected. And so there's a, on your uh, podium, there, there's a letter from Shintel. So Shintel had reached out again saying, hey, things have really not gotten better. In fact, maybe they've gotten a little slower. Um, now, again, I'll caveat all this, but I know AEP has storm damage response um, that they send crews to, and they have a lot of resources that are uh, being pulled in those directions. So we get that, but I think this isn't just a, this has continued to be an, an issue for us even when there aren't storms. Um, and so the storms just make it worse, I think. So uh, Chantel has kind of described some of the issues and concerns that they have. Um, they have um, expressed to me that their concern at the current pace that they're not going to be able to meet the even the extended deadline. So we extended the deadline for this project to next October. They're saying, hey, we want to give you a heads up. If things continue at this pace, as far as the approval of these permits, we're not going to be able to make next October's deadline. So that's kind of the the, the crux of, of where we are and, and why they're kind of reaching out. So I said, hey, kind of summarize the concerns, you know, and I have an authority meeting coming up. I think the appropriate next step would, would likely be sending a, some sort of official communication to AEP, just really expressing our concerns and, and the need to really add more resources to the process. That's, that seems to be the issue is uh, Chantel has offered more resources and even to pay for those resources. And we don't seem to be adding those resources. I think AEP has been reluctant to kind of bring others in. I think they like using their own people that they're, they're comfortable with, but I think we've gotten to a point where we need additional resources to, to kind of help review these and approve these permits. Um, and what Chantel has suggested, and, and I've been on some of those conversations, is that you, you still have the final decision, AEP. You know, you'll still have the oversight of this third party, but we just want there to be more resources, more, more people in the process to keep these permits going and get these permits issued because we're coming up on the holidays now, you know, and then we're coming into winter with more storm damage and so forth. So I think it's critical that we kind of press on them that some additional resources are needed. And uh, I think one thing Chantel has tried to make clear to me is that a lot of these costs for additional resources and the permitting review is not necessarily an extra cost for AEP. It's actually a lot of that is being paid by Chantel. Um, and so through permit cost and, and again, they've offered to bring in additional third parties and pay for those third parties. So. It shouldn't really be a cost issue for AEP. It's, it seems to be more of just, there's just not enough resources to, to go around and, and do that. So if it's the authority's pleasure, I, I can work with the, the, the chair uh, of the authority and we can put together a, a letter to, to AEP and, and also copy the state to make them aware that, you know, hey, we're, we're pushing, but we're still having these, 
these issues and delays that are really kind of beyond our control to a large degree. Um, you know, and just not waiting to a month or two before the deadline, but kind of making sure we're getting that word out there, you know, well in advance that, you know, hey, we need, we need help to keep, you know, pushing, moving the needle, if you will. So um, that's, that would be my ask, I guess, uh, at this point is, is if, if the authority feels comfortable with, with us putting together a letter and, and sending that off on the behalf of the authority, I think that would be a good next step as we continue to, to kind of press on AEP for, for additional help. Um, you know, we've talked about it before where they've got projects across the state, across their coverage area that they're also working on. I get that, but we don't want to be the one that gets kind of pushed to the bottom <laughs> or, or left behind. So we're roughly halfway through um, this project, and so we really need to, to, to get a good push to, to kind of finish on time. So... I don't know if you had any additional thoughts on that, but that would sure. be my kind of ask, and, and we can work together to, sure. to kind of put that letter out in the next week or two. So are there any questions or comments from the authority members, Marshall? I think it would be good to get on the record. Sure, with a, with a letter, but I don't think you're going to get nowhere. I wonder, they've allocated a lot of, or I wonder, I feel like they've allocated uh, some manpower back down to North Carolina and the damaged area. We've had, I'm sure you're going to have a hard time coming up with anybody, or they are. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's going to be their response as well, is that the storm damage, but you don't wreck it anyway. That'd be good. Steve, I was in a meeting this morning, and one of the uh, AEP employees is on the board, and he stated that uh, AEP has fared very well with taking care of the storm damage. So it was a little contrary to some of the rhetoric around the backup relative to broadband. Yeah, and I, I guess to, to Mr. Jamison's point, too, is, you know, they do send some outside the area. They do. That, to Florida and Georgia and other places as well. But I guess my thing is that can't always be the excuse. We, we've got to we've got to find another solution to, to make this happen. And so I feel like Chantel had a very good solution of offering just really a whole other company to say, hey, we'll, we'll put this company on the job and we'll pay them if you just let them do the work. And, They've and, refused that. And, yep. Any other comments or questions from authority members? I have one. Steve, so um, Amanda seems to know the organization really well, and I wonder, have you talked to her about the best approach with AEP to try to get those resources, like maybe writing the letter is, or and if you write a letter, who does it go to? Um, what's the best way in to hopefully get the right answer? Yes. So, yes, been talking to her continuously about this really for months. Um, the, before the letter goes out, you, you touched exactly on, you know, who, who's the right person that this needs to get to. And what I don't want to do is, is send something that puts her in a difficult spot because I think she's doing what she can. I think she, mm -hmm. needs, she needs help from above, I think, to, to make it happen. And so to, to your point, uh, I do want to reach out to her now that if it's the consensus of the authority to send a letter to say, hey, look, you, you know, we want to see some more movement here. Who, who's the right person that we direct this to? And, and, and not not cause her more issues, but but you know really help her help us get exactly. a solution. Yeah, because she's on she's part of our team. She is. Yeah, yeah. I think she's doing what she can to, to help okay. us. Um, but she's I think she's ultimately limited in some of those choices and decisions. Mm -hmm. Is that all, Mr. Quinn? Yep, that's it. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Are you all in support of a letter um, being sent under uh, my signature on behalf of, of the authority? to just reiterate these points and, this, and the necessity. And I would say you almost use the word severity that we do not um, go beyond our deadline of October 2025. We, we, how many deadline requests have we had? Two? Has it been over? Just, over, just the one extension. Just the one ex yeah. I thought we had two. Yeah, for this project, just the one. Yeah. So um, uh, in the uh, review, it just seems to me that it's AP engineering and then it's construction resources. Those are the two main areas from, from what I've read. Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, Construction as in replacing poles and so forth. Yes, yeah. and if they're yeah. provider-owned poles, <laughs> all, all they need to do is just evaluate whether they can add another line on it. You know, it's, it's a capacity and weight issue, um, not necessarily a new pole. So I often wonder how many of those 10,000 plus poles are there versus uh, new pole needing to be identified because 
I don't know well, if you know the I, to I that. think what happens, one of the challenges is a lot of the, the poles are older. Yeah. And so a lot of the poles, I think, are having to be replaced. When I say new pole, that's what I meant, was you were taking the old one out and putting a new one in. Um, so I think that's that's the time, you know, once the permit's issued, that's the, t- the part that takes the longest amount of time after mm-hmm. the permit's issued is to actually put a new pole in the ground and reconnect the wires to that new pole. So I think there's a lot of those just because the the age of the poles in our county and probably a lot of the service area of, of APCO, are, they're just older. Um, and so they, they have to be replaced. And so the, we're not the only project that they have. You know, of course, they're not everywhere in the state, but they have a number of projects in their territory that they're struggling with this. and and. We're also not the only locality struggling with this. I can assure you, it's 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 really statewide, and so I think the the state will get into the Make Ready initiative next because that's kind of the state's response last year was to to try to infuse a little bit of money to help kind of push um, push things along, and so I can kind of get into that as far as what the state is, has done and what the state is looking at. Sure, I'd just like to get a motion on record um, to authorize a letter. To go to AEP expressing our concerns about the delays in construction. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Tatum. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. That carries unanimously. Oh, Mr. Quinn. So, Steve, when I was just thinking through the challenge with evaluating the polls. And I was thinking that there's probably a lot of, I'll call it grunt work and analytical work and research on the front end that could be done by somebody. And and then the real decision making is what AEP would want to reserve for themselves. And so I was wondering, uh, it maybe part of this letter could be asking them how we could augment their staff, you know, so that they obviously don't want to lose control of the polls, right? But they might be willing to have somebody that did research and analytical work and, and calculations, but didn't make the final decision because they want to do that. So I, I just wonder if there's a path where they would take somebody on that would help them instead of jeopardize or risk their uh, control. Yeah, we can make sure that's in the letter, and, and those are the kind of things we've been kind of asking for months, and those are the, uh, that's really the proposal from Chantel was to provide those those resources either on the, the front end of the permit review and initiation and or the poll replacement part. Um, they, they've really offered to, to provide resources that could help with both of those. And so at this point, AEP's really been resistant to that. Um, I think... If I can guess, it's because it's not some of their pre-approved people, if you will, uh, um, organizations. They, they work a lot with outside uh, contractors, but they have kind of their list. And, and so I think they've been reluctant maybe to, to add more to their list for whatever reason. Um, but that's what Chantel's really been pushing is, hey, these folks do work for Dominion and these folks do work for these other companies. It's really the same thing. You know, they, they, they can do a good job for us here as well. Um, and so we'll continue to keep pushing, you know, for, for that idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sandy. Uh, if you'll help me with that, uh, we'll mm-hmm. certainly get that out. Yep. Okay. Um, the next item was just... Uh, Part of, you know, this issue really came to a head last year in the General Assembly as well during the session um, earlier this year because uh, a lot of localities and, and Internet service providers started to, to peak up about we're really having issues with this Make Ready uh, work. And if you recall, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to put all the blame on the power companies because, you know, the, the state and the federal government provided all this funding and put it all on these projects and awarded all these projects, several hundred million dollars worth of projects across the state. And previously it had only been about 50 million or 100 million. And so all of a sudden you you do four or five times the same amount of work and, and you're piling that on to what's already in the pipeline. And so uh, for whatever reason, you know, I don't know if, if the power company didn't really think about this workload that would be coming or, you know, who didn't think about it, but um, all these projects started to hit and it, and it really bogged down the system uh, because there's just not enough resources to, to go around. Um, you know, same as contractors and supplies and all those things that we, we really, I think, going into this thought, 
uh, getting supplies because we were coming off of COVID. I think we thought getting supplies was going to be the number one issue. That really hasn't been an issue. I think a lot of these uh, internet providers did a good job of kind of ordering ahead so they would have the, the, the supplies that they needed. The real issue that, that really came to a head this last year is, is the utility companies and their ability to approve these permits and make these, these changes to the polls. And so what the General Assembly did was uh, they allocated some more funding to put into a pot for what they called Make Ready uh, Initiative and really what that was to help to offset some of the additional cost and also to provide some resources to find these alternatives like we were just talking about, like, hey, can we get another third party and, and pay them to, to do this work and help speed up the process and move things along. And so there were a number of different things that they uh, provided the funding for. And so uh, the, the first round of that just went into effect and just closed and they just made awards. And we, uh, we worked with Chantel to basically recoup some of their costs that they had put in with some of this prepayment uh, that they had done for a lot of this make ready work. And so um, we were awarded uh, three of these, uh, three of these grants, I guess you'd call them grants. Um, and that was really about $300,000. I think there was a copy of this uh, included um, that we were successful in getting that funding uh, in the first round. Now I was telling the, the chair is that there's going to be two or three more rounds of this funding to continue to find ways to improve the processes. And if there's state money that's needed to kind of push the process along, that it's available through that. And so it can be through the use of hiring contractors, hiring additional resources. It could be uh, changing how you're doing the work. So it can be putting some of it underground instead of attaching to poles. Um, and so some of that is happening. Um, I know that was one of my first questions, and I know uh, the chair had asked me the same thing is, well, can we just change our project to underground? Well, I think the answer is yes, we can change it to underground, but what that requires is, is really redesigning it all, which, which will take several months. Um, and then it also adds additional costs because putting it underground is, is, is typically is more expensive than, than going overhead. And so it can be, but I think what we're trying to balance is how can we do some modification to underground, which doesn't require us to spend a lot more money and a lot more time. Um, and so we're trying to find that mix of how we keep the project going, how we can kind of make it move faster, but not set us way back where we kind of redesign the whole project because again, we're halfway through it. It's all been designed already for the aerial. It's just, we're really just waiting on these permits to, to allow us to continue the next phase you know, of the project. So we're, there is funding. I guess the point of this is the, the state realized there was a need. Uh, they, they started to, to put some money into here to help with the process. Uh, there are some more opportunities to, to get additional funding to help kind of move things along. So between this program and, and a letter to American Electric Power, hopefully we can continue to push, you know, push this project forward and, and keep us on schedule or get us back on track, um, however you want to phrase that. So that's the Make Ready Initiative. Um, next is, is Mr. just- Mr. Sandy, well, can I interrupt you? Yeah, sure, any questions on that? Um, the Make Ready Initiative, uh, is this competitively submitted? It is. Okay, all right, so it's just not readily available. It's competitive each round. You have certain, uh, you have to submit an application. You have to uh, turn it in by a certain deadline. Okay. There's, there's certain um, amounts that you actually can ask for based on the, the initial amount of your award. So there's a lot of different parameters that, that they've kind of set on it. Thank you. Um, and so we were we were successful. I, I think I'm glad you know we worked on this first round to, to kind of get in first, and, and we were successful in getting that. Hopefully we can continue to be successful because there will be some other parts that we'll, we'll probably be able to use some additional assistance. And I'll just say here is that really this is just a pass-through for us. Um, so this isn't any money that the county is going to see. It's really just a pass through for those additional costs that Chantel incurred um, through the process so far. Okay. Any, any questions? other questions about the Make Ready grant? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. All right. And then the other, since we're talking about grants, kind of really the next step, which you've, you've heard a little bit about, is 
we're moving towards the national kind of grant program, which is B B E A D. Um, we all love our acronyms. Um, so, so BEAD is the next kind of big pot of money, if you will, that's becoming available to the state. The state is looking to get $1.4 billion from this program, um, and it's coming from the feds. And then um, this will be a, a really a grant program that's monitored by the state, but it's, it's really funded by the feds. And so uh, the state has been working with them for really the last 18 months or more on developing these processes and procedures. We, from everything I've heard, Virginia is kind of one of the front runners. We'll be one of the first that are kind of ready to go um, under this program because I think they've used a lot of the experience with body to, to kind of help them kind of chart out the path with bead. And so we'll be um, working with them. Some of the major differences with this program is the county is not the grant awardee. Um, the individual internet service providers make application to the to the program. So for, for me, that's actually good. It's that's great. Um, we're certainly still involved, but it'll really be a, a contract between the state and the internet provider in these cases. The big the big thing that will bring us into play is each one of these internet service providers will be looking for a um, letter of support from the counties because they get, I think, 10 points on their application if they have a letter of support from the county. And so I just making you aware of that and i also gave you a handout here which kind of talks about what what that process is um, again it's we don't have to issue it but th there's also really not a big downfall to issuing it to three or four different providers um, what our goal what i would say our goal should be is just making sure whoever we're supporting is working towards getting everybody covered um, and so as long as they're working towards that goal I think we could support it. It doesn't mean we monetarily support anything. We don't have to put any money into uh, these applications, which is another nice uh, piece. Um, we can, but we don't have to. Um, so the, the requirements for us have kind of drastically reduced under this program, uh, but just really wanted to make you aware of the request for letters of support because probably November, or maybe December meeting, I'll be coming back to you with those requests. Uh, I know River Street is already kind of looking for a letter of support. Um, Chantel is still evaluating uh, what they're gonna do with bead. Zytel likely will be looking for one as well. So uh, CenturyLink is, or Brightspeed has actually reached out as well. So I think we'll have several requests um, and we'll just wanna make sure that however we're supporting it, that we make sure our interests are covered. You know, if those applications eventually get funded um, that we're kind of, uh, at least in the loop for the project, even if we haven't financially contributed, that we kind of know what's happening and we know what the kind of ultimate goal is and the ultimate build out. So that's really just a, a kind of a quick update there. Stay tuned. The applications aren't open yet for that. So I think we're, we're still a few months out from that um, process getting started, but we're getting closer kind of every every month. And for those of you that are going to VACO, you'll probably hear more about it um, in some of the various meetings there as well. So it's obviously a lot of money. Um, you know, 1.4 billion hopefully gets everybody in the state covered. Um, you know, what, that's the hope anyway. Steve, um, how, how does that, is there going to be an interface from B to VADI? Um, is VADI going to, I mean, is the state of Virginia basically going to be able in their vernacular to pull back on funding VADI grants because of B? Yes, um, if I follow your question, yeah, yeah, they really won't have to continue to fund VADI the way it's been funded. I think there'll still be some uh, various needs for funds there uh, for different programs. And one that I would uh, point out as part of our legislative agenda mm -hmm. is that, that we would like to see that some of that bead money be spent to increase cellular coverage uh, across the Commonwealth. And so one, the, the state could fund some of that um, and or local governments maybe could also contribute kind of like we did in the VADI program is, is, you know, we could leverage some of those dollars to get more antennas put up in more remote areas of the Commonwealth. Um, I don't want to sound like a commercial, more, more coverage in more areas, but that's really what we're looking for. Um, I think 
Bland County, I guess, recently with, and, and some of the other counties recently with the storms. I mean, I think they were out of cellular coverage for, for a lot of their areas just because they probably only had a, a few sites to start with, and so they didn't have a lot of redundancy. So um, we all know there's still areas in Franklin County where you have no cell service. Vadi really didn't do anything for cellular service, and so I think the next step um, that, that we're pushing with the General Assembly and with DHCD is, hey, let's, let's focus now on this, this next phase, if you will, next step to, to increase cellular coverage. And that not only helps all uh, individuals and students out there, I think it also has a big public safety component to it. And it has a big agriculture component. I mean, uh, you've got a lot of tractors with a lot of technology, and if you can't connect to anything, it, it doesn't do you a lot of good. And so I think there's a lot of reasons to, for the state to, to kind of push that, that needle. And I've been trying to toot that horn, you know, where I can, and I think it's, you know, getting some traction. So um, I think to your original question, I think that's kind of what body maybe morphs into is, is – funding some other initiatives to, right. to kind of help, you know, with the whole connectivity thing. We'll just pause here up for questions um, from the authority members with regard to BEAD. Any questions, clarifications that you'd like to see answered? No. Okay. Ma'am, yes ma'am. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jamison. Steve, I don't know who to talk to. You give me a name and number, I'll call them. But this morning, Chantel run a line through my property right through my hay field to a, another house and you would think I mean you know they would have some kind of GIS or something to stop it actually it was my daughter's house they was hooking up and my 10 year old granddaughter said hey they're coming up through Papa's field here <laughs> so my daughter went out and stopped them they rerouted it but it's still in my field they went around the edge of it and all so uh, they need to do a little bit better. Now, I understood there were some circumstances. They went the poll that whoever come out and coordinated with the homeowner as far as installation from Chantel said they were coming from one poll. When the crew got there, they had to go back to the other pole down line because of the wire in a box or something there. Okay. Yeah, I can get you a contact. If you give me a contact, I'd like to. And uh, also, I think last month Nick brought up a question about how many homes in each district were hooked yep. up. Yep, I'm working on that. Um, my GIS guy has been out on some medical leave, mm -hmm. so hopefully for the November meeting or before, I'll be able to provide you that information. And I ask about the wireless down at Cal Alpha Tower down there. I, I did reach out on that, so let me follow back up on. Is there a limit on the minimum number of uh, people that use that tower before the county has to kick in any money or is that a problem or is that in there at all no, no cost to it no how few are on it how few are on it how few are on it? I, that's what i need to follow back up on i did reach out to to the the company to to get that information so i'll have to reach back out to get that number but there are there are users on it i just don't know what that exact number is right now so he he can give me that Hopefully, before you leave today, I'll be able to. That's that's fine. To get right. in for, my guess is it's it's probably around thirty, but I don't know for sure. So there's there's not really a minimum. There'd be kind of the converse would be actually be a maximum. So there there would be a maximum that one of those sites could kind of hold. You know, a maximum number of users. So there is no charge. If it, you know they don't have a target number that we don't have to pay the county, doesn't have to kick in money. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mr. Mitchell. <clears throat> Steve, I'm going to ask my regular broadband meeting question. The last update I was given for the Verizon at, <clears throat> on the tower on 890 was October 31st <clears throat> for that to be operational. Do you know if that's changed? or? I knew that question was going to come up. So <laughs> I've, I've I was got... sitting at Snow Creek School this morning, and I could not use my phone. <laughs> so, so the response I got was that they're still waiting on their 5G equipment antenna orders. There's a national backup. Um, their order is due mid-October, which that's next week, right? Or today. <laughs> um, once their equipment is in the warehouse later this month, then they can allocate them to the projects. So I don't have a date for you other than that's the latest update I got. Was as soon as those things get in the shop, 
then they can say, okay, this one's going to Snow Creek. You know, this equipment is going to Snow Creek. And then they can make their application for building permit and be able to put it up. So I'm still hopeful it's this year. Um, but that's literally from 11 o'clock this morning. That was the update. So Thank you. Mm -hmm. Steve, I do have a question. Um, are we going to enter into any MOUs with respect to BEAD and the vendors that are working on our behalf? I think that's a question that, that we can discuss as far as, you know, when we do letters of support, how much, how much is our support worth? You know, like how much do we want to be tied to the project? Um, you know, I think at a minimum we would want to have, yeah, at least a simple MOU that says, hey, you're going to give us constant updates, right. you know, as to project activity, you know, those kind of things. I think some of it depends on how involved we are and how involved we want to be if that makes sense oh it does so if, does. if we're putting in millions of dollars we probably want to be much more involved um if we're not putting in anything then there may be a lesser degree that we want to be involved so that would be something i would ask you guys to think about is is you know prior to the next meeting is just you know what what do we want to have before we issue a letter of support and they if they're successful getting the grant what does that relationship look like, um, you know, for for us and them and the state kind of moving forward? Because as I mentioned earlier, the, the state is not going to be in a contract with us. They're right. going to be in a contract with the, the ISP specifically. But certainly we want to keep abreast of what's going on and be aware of what's happening um, because me and you guys will still be the ones to get those phone calls that, um, you know, wondering where the service is. And these are Franklin County centric projects. That's the reason that I ask. Yep. Um, would it be um, asking too much to see if you could maybe draft um, something in terms of maybe some um, suggested draft bullets for an MOU to let the authority look at those, um, maybe just to stimulate our thinking, mm -hmm. uh, whether we want to expand upon those or, or have questions? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on, on B? Great questions. Okay. Steve, did you have any other business under your updates? I do not. I think that was all I had. Okay, thank you for all of your updates. Sure, thank you. Uh, at this time on the agenda, uh, we've reserved time for comments by the authority members. Um, so, Mr. Jamison, do you have anything? Ma'am. Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Carter? No, ma'am, thank you. Mr. Tatum? I'm good. And Mr. Quinn? All set. And I have nothing. So, hearing that, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the Broadband Authority meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you all for your time this our afternoon. Our first line of business uh, will be our invocation and our Pledge of Allegiance. And before we have our prayer, I just would like to offer uh, our condolences to Supervisor Mike Carter for the loss of his father last week. And uh, I just want you to know our thoughts and prayers have been with you and will continue to be with you. But this time I ask uh, Supervisor Marshall Jamison, if he will, to uh, lead us in the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Supervisor Nick Mitchell. All stand, please. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Lord. We just ask that you would be with us, guide us, give us wisdom, Lord, give us discernment. But we also lift up the, the victims, Lord, of all the hurricane victims we've had. To just be with them, Lord. The ones that's uh, suffered, that have lost their property, Lord, also lost uh, family and lives. Just watch over, dear Lord. Just that you just continue to be with Ronnie, dear Lord, and give him a quick recovery. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> All right. Any thoughts or concerns about the agenda from anyone this morning? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I will, Mr. Chairman. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, let me know by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Let me see, uh, known that it was unopposed. Uh, recognition of VACO Achievements Award 
program presented by Jeremy Bennett, Director of uh, Governmental Affairs, Virginia Association of Counties. We have uh, Jeremy Bennett from VACO with us today. He's going to come up and discuss the VACO Achievement Awards program, uh, followed by uh, Jeff Eckernot, who will speak to uh, us about See Us Smile winning program. Mr. Bennett uh, will then pick things back up and we'll have some discussion about the VACO legislative agenda. Mr. Bennett, thank you. Great. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Administrator Whitlow. My name is Jeremy Bennett, uh, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs with the Virginia Association of Counties, VACO. And uh, as always, it is my distinct pleasure to be back in Franklin County. Uh, especially if I can proceed the board meeting with uh, lunch at Whole Bean and with the knowledge that on my way back, uh, Homestead, Homestead Creamery is actually on my route, so <laughs> looking forward to that. Um, but more importantly, it is my distinct privilege to present the VACO Achievement Award. And for the benefit of your constituents who may not be familiar with the Virginia Association of Counties, uh, VACO has existed since 1934 to serve and support your efforts as county officials. Uh, we support counties in many ways. First is through our advocacy at the General Assembly and at the federal level. Uh, we also support counties through our educational programs, member services, and communication efforts. Uh, I should acknowledge also that uh, uh, Chair, uh, uh, Supervisor Smith is also part of our VACO steering committee as our vice chair of our general government steering committee. But in 2003, uh, we established our Achievement Award program to recognize counties that have adopted innovative approaches to providing public services uh, and that could serve as models for other counties to emulate. And today, I'm very proud to present Franklin County with its Achievement Award for the year. Uh, this is VACO's 22nd Annual Achievement Awards program. And uh, in this year, we received 145 entries. Uh, of which only 45 winners were selected from 32 counties. So uh, with only 30%, 31% of entries selected as winners, it is a truly competitive program. Uh, this is Franklin County's sixth Achievement Award, and uh, Franklin County won in uh, 2012, uh, 2020, twice in 2021, and also in 2022, which I think was the last time I was here to present uh, for your library uh, automated program. Uh, so there are several criteria our judges followed as guidelines. Does the program offer an innovative solution to a problem or situation or delivery of services? Uh, does it promote intergovernmental cooperation? And is it a model uh, for other counties to emulate, among other criteria? So I, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff uh, to actually speak more about the program. Um, but you know, the, the, the off-grid solar backup radio site definitely impressed our judges. And uh, you know, I'll say it was a great model for other counties to consider going forward. Um, but before, uh, uh, once Jeff speaks, maybe, um, and we present the award, maybe we can just get a picture of uh, the folks and you know, we can share that with our membership at our annual conference and on our website, if that's also okay with you. Uh, but with that, I will turn things over to Jeff. Uh, so, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, Administrator Whitlow, and members of the board, I, I want to express my gratitude for a few minutes to, I, I think, really to brag on some team members that made this possible. But I also wanted to start just by expressing my thanks as, uh, as a board and to my direct leadership team for allowing uh, folks like myself and my partners to foster creativity. I truly think this is an innovative and really a creative solution. It's also a very fiscally competitive or, or fiscally conservative solution to solve a safety issue in Boone's Mill. Uh, so for that, uh, I want to express my appreciation because uh, folks like yourself make a creative environment possible. Uh, so with that, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the project and we'll, we'll get into some frequencies and talk about uh, the RF spectrum. I'm only kidding. Um, but Steve knows that I would love to love to chat with you anytime about, about those fun details. So I'd like to set up the problem. Uh, it's a problem many of you know, and it's a problem that we've sought federal assistance and funding for. Our radio system, unfortunately, has a very isolated and very small gap in coverage, and that's in the town of Boone's Mill. Now, we wouldn't notice that if it was, say, on top of a mountain covered by trees where once in 10 years we're on a search and rescue mission, but regretfully, this coverage gap exists in a populated area along the State Corridor 220, uh, Boone's Mill Road, Bethlehem Road, and many other uh, isolated areas in between. And so our law enforcement officers, the Boone's Mill Town Police, and our fire rescue members from Public Safety and the Boone's Mill Volunteer Fire Department frequent this area and often remind me that their portable radios don't always work. 
So that's effectively the problem that, that I wanted to try to put a, a stopgap measure in. Uh, like I mentioned, we are seeking uh, funding and support for a definitive solution, uh, but that solution in 2023, we didn't even know if we would receive federal funding to implement a tower with all the proper repeater infrastructure. <laughs> So the thought that came to my mind was installing an analog radio repeater site. Um, what I had to conquer at that point was uh, I needed land. Land is not hard or not easy to come by. I needed a proper elevation for some transmitter antennas. Uh, I couldn't do it alone. I needed assistance of a tractor. I needed uh, some infrastructure, a concrete pad to be poured. And so the public-private partnership, as well as the intergovernmental partnership that we received to make this happen, the town of Boone's Mill, uh, PSG Electric, uh, the Boone's Mill Volunteer Fire Department, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, and the communications shop all came together to realize uh, this solution. Uh, and so this is a brief timeline. I, I will not go into detail here, but we knew that there was a problem back in 2021. Granted, we knew there were challenges before then, but the study that MORCOM did in 21 that launched our funding request for a definitive solution with some assistance from a federal grant was this study. And you can see that conspicuous little gray shape. Uh, that's a essentially a coverage gap in our 800 megahertz infrastructure, and it regretfully sits right at that intersection of 220 Bethlehem Road and Boone's Mill Road. So we knew that there was a problem, and we now had data that supported it. What I needed to find was a location that had an elevation that could support this infrastructure. I also needed power, but I didn't want to burden the taxpayers with a costly temporary solution, so that introduced a solar option for us. So what we ended up doing is using equipment we already had on hand. We reprogrammed it. We uh, were able to secure solar for a very low cost, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And we secured volunteer labor to resurrect the roof of this 35-foot uh, tall uh, water tank. This water tank's no longer in use, and you can see by the just the, the picture uh, at the site, this was kind of our vision. Uh, you know, it's always fun to draw, but to really see something come together takes, takes team members and, and cooperation. So what we had to do is this was a, a town-owned property in Boone's Mill. Uh, they gave us access. We had an existing easement. We were able to rehabilitate a roadway. Um, again, with volunteer uh, support. This is your ground level picture. We had a lot of tree trimming and, and work to do, uh, but this came together with volunteer labor. Uh, many members of the town of Boone's Mill and the Boone's Mill Fire Department brought tractors on a Saturday. They cleared the road you see here in this picture. Uh, we had uh, the chief, uh, Riley Peters, who couldn't be here today, and a Boone's Mill fire member is there with uh, BT Fitzpatrick and myself uh, pouring a concrete slab. We needed that slab for our small equipment shelter. We just so happened to have that metal shelter left over from our old radio system. So again, really trying to reuse and recycle where possible. Uh, that took us to some of this work. You can see many faces here, some you might recognize, but PSG Electric loaned us a bucket truck. They also helped us for the day with many of their tools that we don't have. We were able to install a 12-foot mast antenna, and you can also see in the lower uh, left corner some pictures of the solar infrastructure that I was able to secure. And uh, today, this site runs 24-7, 365. Uh, officers are able to rotate their radio knob on their portable radio to the analog channel. That's probably the only gap in this solution being a permanent one. And they're able to communicate from the Shell station, from Canada's. They're able to communicate up and down the 220 corridor. And the same is applicable to our members of the volunteer fire department at Boone's Mill. They can rotate their channel knob and they can communicate a distress or emergency signal directly to dispatch which is something they couldn't do before this tower was uh, made possible. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't thank a lot of people, and I will likely forget a lot of names. So I will thank uh, BT and the town of Boone's Mill. We couldn't have done it without their partnership. 
They also split some funding with us in that they purchased the concrete for the pad. I brought some used radio equipment, things like that. The Boone's Mill Volunteer Fire Department, we couldn't have done it without them. They brought their brush truck. We mixed the concrete. Uh, they were able to push the road in for us, trim the trees. Uh, PSG Electric, Brad Basham and DJ Canada, who couldn't be with us today. They're a local operator. They're also both avid volunteers at Rocky Mountain Ferrum. Uh, they saw the need for this and they donated their time, their equipment, and their bucket truck. Finally, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. I'm joined by some of my, my team members and uh, the, the Sheriff's Office as well. We couldn't have done this without them. Uh, always happy to take you out for show and tell if you're out and about one day or weekend and want to see some of our great radio infrastructure. But I'll close by just saying thank you for the opportunity to do something creative like this to help public safety and, and, and the county. And thank thank you. you for your service to the county as well. Absolutely. Jeff, oh. Well, I was going to say, uh, I think, a round of applause for Franklin County, first and foremost, and for the folks putting it together. And uh, have the Achievement Award here, so um, I'm not sure if you want us up there or in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, as the board takes their seats, uh, I would like to thank Jeff Eckernot. He is uh, quite modest, um, a lot of that creativity. Um, what I like to say, uh, Jeremy Bennett in, in Franklin County, that's some very wise and astute Franklin County engineering, and it's get it done. And, uh, <laughs> and our folks uh, continue to amaze me uh, in how they do that in our operation. So uh, Jeff, you're, you're mighty modest and, and your team, but thank you very much for all that effort. All right, moving right along. Yes, sir, and I believe I'm the next agenda item as well. Yep. Uh, I was asked by uh, uh, Steve Sandy in Franklin County just to provide a uh, legislative update, uh, kind of an overview of the VACO leg legislative process, as well as some issues that we anticipate uh, seeing, uh, some repeats, some new ones, uh, the coming 2025 General Assembly session, which uh, someone one of my friends posted is less than 100 days away, which is not a, always something to look forward to. But anyway, um, I appreciate to share that, that information about VACO, uh, our legislative process and draft priorities. Uh, we've been working this entire year uh, diligently to craft our draft 2025 legislative pl pl program that reflects the diverse needs and challenges faced by local governments across the Commonwealth. Uh, this process begins with our regional meetings uh, across the state. As you all know, you were kind enough to host us last year uh, for Franklin County's region, uh, where VACO staff will travel uh, across the Commonwealth or hold virtual meetings with our members uh, to solicit feedback on our existing program and, uh, again, challenges and opportunities that you think uh, we need to be addressing uh, going forward in the Commonwealth. So the uh, VACO staff take all that feedback from our members, from you, and we uh, draft a legislative, uh, preliminary legislative program, which is then presented to our eight uh, policy steering committees at the VACO County Officials Summit in August. Um, we receive feedback from our members on those committees, uh, such as uh, Supervisor Smith, and uh, we take that feedback uh, and make edits to the program for to be presented at those same steering committees at our annual conference in November. Uh, those steering committees will then take final action uh, from their end on their platforms, including priorities, and submit that to the resolutions committee, which is comprised of the chair and vice chair of each of the steering committees, as well as uh, our VACO's executive committee, uh, will have their chance to have input into the process 
And then uh, that is sent to the, uh, the full uh, membership uh, during our annual business meeting at the annual conference for each county to weigh in on and uh, ultimately ratify. So um, as we head into 2025, there are several key areas that will be the forefront of our legislative efforts. And I just want to take a few moments to highlight the most pressing issues at a high level uh, and what we expect uh, from the General Assembly this coming session, many of which you know, do overlap with uh, Franklin County's legislative program. So uh, one of our big ones and one near and dear to my heart is uh, education funding. Um, I'm sure you, you've been following the, uh, the work that was stemmed from the 2023 JLARC report. There's now a joint subcommittee on elementary and secondary education that is making recommendations to the General Assembly. We're very involved with them on operational funding and restoring you know, balance in the funding formula relationship between state and localities. Uh, we also will continue to pursue efforts uh, regard to school construction. Uh, obviously, our 1% our bill didn't get over the finish line last year. Uh, whether um, if it's brought forward again, we will support it this, this coming year. Uh, but if not, we anticipate maybe with a new administration pursuing it more aggressively in that time. Uh, we continue to export, uh, ex uh, support broadband expansion. Uh, I know obviously your broadband committee met earlier uh, talking about some of the opportunities and challenges. So until we have full coverage, um, you know, additional resources and local flexibility will be priorities for VACO. Uh, as will housing and workforce development. Um, I know that's an issue across the Commonwealth and across the nation. So looking for creative solutions without uh, infringing upon local authority will be uh, also some of our priorities and definitely a topic of discussion at the General Assembly. Uh, for transportation and infrastructure, We've seen massive uh, federal infusions through the IAJA and other uh, federal programs. Uh, we, we are committed to making sure that the state doesn't offset their commitment to uh, transportation funding uh, with those federal dollars, and we continue to receive the support or increase the support needed uh, for all of our communities. Um, I'll just say uh, energy is also a big issue. Um, we, we actually have an energy podcast that my colleague Joe Lurch has put together. I'd encourage you all to check it out. Uh, but it's really talking about the challenges that we face with increased demand from data centers or you know, issues with uh, local land authority through solar, uh, data centers, et cetera, um, it, it's definitely an issue that we expect legislation on and uh, we'll continue to work on. And, and really, the overall, the, the two big areas that kind of bind all these issues together are, of course, preventing unfunded mandates being passed on to you and preserving local, uh, local authority and control, and whether that's over land use or anything else. So those are just kind of some really high-level stuff, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, happy to take questions about further issues, but um, I'll just say in, in closing that you know we really appreciate the feedback that we get from our members such as yourselves. It helps us be better representatives for you and better advocates in Richmond and beyond. Uh, so with that, I'll just say thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present on those issues, and I'm happy to answer any questions if the board has them. Thank you for coming, and, and I can't say enough how much we appreciate the support that we get from VACO oh, and you, all of your uh, partners in VACO. Uh, we don't always show our appreciation, but we do appreciate what you do. Uh, members, are there any questions or anything you'd like to say to Jeremy? Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jeremy, thank you. How do you access this, that energy podcast you mentioned? Uh, if it's all right with uh, the, the board, I can send that to either uh, the Administrator Whitlow or, or to uh, Deputy Administrator Sandy, and uh, he can share that with, with the group. It is, it is on our website. Uh, there's about four or five episodes, and I was actually, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd, but I was listening to some of them on the way down uh, as I went, so, um, and Joe does a great job, but I'll make sure that you all have a link or access to that so you can okay. listen Thank in your you. own time. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Anyone? Uh, Mr. Chairman, sure. Vice Chair, if sure. I may. Right Jeremy, in. thank you so much for being with us. It's it's such a pleasure for us to have the ability to work with VACO, and I feel like you all are family at this point, all the time I've been spending with you, uh, but it's time that we're all learning together and appreciate that very much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say holistically and generally speaking, these unfunded mandates as they relate to school resource officers and as they uh, with the med box with you know for our on our public safety side of the picture um, these are two things that i know appear uh, with vaco and you all are advocating vigorously for those things and it, it appears on our legislative agenda as well so we just want to reinforce i think those two things um, you know we're getting hit with um, unfunded mandates is kind of a pickup term but mm -hmm. the reality is it has a real impact on our tax base and our taxpayers, unfunded mandates equate to tax increases. 
And, and so we've really got, to, we appreciate the support that you all are providing us uh, in that regard. So um, I was telling Jeremy before the meeting, um, when we as a board work on crafting our legislative agenda every year, one of our main reference points is the VACO legislative summary that we get. And we stay very closely aligned with VACO. Um, you know, and, and then we have some of the more tailored issues to Franklin County. But uh, it, it just is really good to be part of an overall effort, Jeremy, that we can hold hands and we can look to get some things done. And I know VACO is highly regarded um, with the General Assembly uh, and so forth. So again, uh, we appreciate those opportunities and we stand ready to support VACO in any way that we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Jeremy? I don't see any. Again, thank you so thank, much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Enjoy your ice cream. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> okay, moving right along, moving to the consent agenda for the board. What's your pleasure? Mr. Vice Chair, if there are no exceptions, I would move the approval of the consent agenda as submitted. Okay, we have a second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion before a call for a final vote? Yeah, I'm going to call for a final vote, and then I'm going to go through each one of these uh, proclamations that we just approved. So all in favor, Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Supervisor Mitchell? Yes. Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. And Chairman Thompson is absent for the vote. We just, on our consent agenda today, we just uh, approved these uh, four proclamations. And I want to just uh, go through each one of those real quick if I can. The first proclamation is Proclamation of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, this uh, first is to proclaim October 2024 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. There will be an event on October 26 at 5 p.m. at the Rocky Mount Farmers Market hosted by the Franklin County Resource Center promoting safe families. And uh, I have a note here that Angela Phillips is going to be here, but I also see Katrina Hancock here. And so at this time, uh, Katrina is here from the Franklin County Resource Center. And uh, would you like to come up and say a few words to us? Let's tell us how things are going, and good to see you again today. I wasn't expected to speak, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I am Katrina Hancock. I'm actually with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. I'm the Domestic Violence Advocate Coordinator. Um, and I just want to appreciate um, you all taking the time to, to recognize this proclamation. I've been doing this work for a long, long time, and the support of the community, the Board of Supervisors, the Sheriff, um, the town, all of us, it, we really appreciate the support. So. Thank you, Katrina, for all that you do. I've known Katrina a long time. Got to work with her for years with, when I was with the Sheriff's Department. Yes. And there's probably not a, another person in this county that I know of that works any harder in her career and, and the, what she does to serve the citizens of Franklin County. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anyone have anything they'd like to ask or say to Katrina while she's here? We appreciate all that you do. Thank it's, you. It goes without saying. And the services that. you provide are understated for sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, I don't see, is Angela here? I don't see her, no, sir. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Moving right along, our Fire Prevention Month proclamation. The second item on the agenda is to proclaim October 2024 as Fire Prevention Month. Uh, the Board of Supervisors urges all residents, landlords, businesses, and other property owners to heed important safety measures to promote, promoted by National Fire Prevention Month and further to recognize uh, and commend all firefighters, both volunteer and career, along with first responders who provide valuable services to educate, prevent, and fight fires. Again, we can't say enough to our uh, staff, volunteer, and career staff as well as the Sheriff's Department and other first responders here that serve Franklin County. Uh, in the 
aftermath of these storms that we've seen hit our country over the last couple of weeks, we can see the, the, the uh, need for support for our first responders. And I just want to say uh, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, thank you to all of our first responders, both career and volunteer. Next uh, National First Responders Day proclamation is the th uh, third proclamation. Uh, it's uh, to proclaim October 28, 2024 is the National First Responders Day. This includes 911 operators, law enforcement officers, firefighters, EMS, special operations, and other roles in the public safety sector, both volunteer and career. We call upon all citizens to observe this day to honor our brave first responders and to pay tribute to those who have lost their lives in the line of duty. Uh, looking around, do we have any first responders here uh, today? If so, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Eric, appreciate you being here, buddy. And uh, I, I saw Pat go out in the hallway. I don't know if she's trying to round up some more, but uh, I will say that it's been a pleasure and an honor to be able to, to serve Franklin County uh, as a first responder. And I take that a great deal of pride in being a first responder for the citizens of Franklin County. And thank you, Eric, and please convey that message to all of our brothers and sisters with the Sheriff's Department. And uh, lastly, our fourth item is to proclaim November 15th, 2024 as Geographic Information Systems Day or GIS Day to acknowledge those that have chosen GIS as their profession to uh, improve the lives of citizens and to recognize and support efforts of nonprofits who work on activities to improve uh, conservation, human services, and various human, hum, humanitarian efforts to better our world. We encourage citizens to learn more about the selection of geo, uh, geospatial resources made available by Franklin County GIS, GIS offices. Again, for our uh, men and women that work in our GIS office here at Franklin County, we convey our sincere thank you for all the hard work that you do in serving the citizens of Franklin County. Okay, with that said, Brian Costello. Good afternoon, Vice Chairman Tatum, members of the board, Mr. Whitlow. Pleasure to be here for the uh, VDOT Road Report for October. We'll begin with the um, previous 30 days of activity. Route 601 Dudley Amos is, is now complete. Um, we have an, on Mary Bet Hollow, Route uh, 807, we had a low water structure replacement, and that's now complete. And then on 220, we have some paving that's been completed. Uh, there are some line markings still to be installed, but they'll be coming back through to complete that work. Looking out for the next 60 days, um, really what we're doing is a lot of primary mowing. This will be our final round, so we're active on 220 and 116, all of our primaries. And then... Um, on Route 40, we just completed a um, pipe replacement project, and that's got to be paved still, but uh, we'll be back to do that with our contract. And then uh, Route 602, we have a lot of work up in Callaway area. We have two pipe projects, and then we have a bridge project that's actually starting today, so you probably see a lot of detour signs, and we've done our best to put, a, I forget how many signs we have out there trying to direct traffic around, but uh, we know that's a little bit of an inconvenience, but we did complete the very first pipe replacement project, and we're moving on to the second one, so hopefully we'll finish up earlier than the six weeks anticipated. But the bridge project will, it'll probably be a, a good two-month project as they anticipate, because uh, I think it's substantial rehabilitation they have to do to that. So lots of activity there uh, on those two, 602 and 641. Um, we have some patching that's going on actively on 619 and paving that's going on there. And um, I mentioned the primary mowing already. Moving over to page two, we have a couple of safety studies that were completed, but there are no recommended changes on those, so nothing substantial there. And then just lastly, we have uh, our bundled projects on Route 220. They are scheduled to have the bids come back later this month so hopefully next month I can present um, where we stand hopefully with some projects moving forward on the 220 corridor so that concludes my 
presentation, and if you all have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. I do have one. You mentioned uh, primary mowing. Are y'all going to do any more secondary mowing? We will, yes. Once we complete our primary, then we'll go back on our secondaries. Okay. I was, I was just curious. On my way home from work this past week, last week actually, on Pullman Switch Road, I had a close encounter with Yogi, and uh, he came out of nowhere, mm. uh, and, and I, it would have been helpful if it grass had been cut back a little right. bit. Right. We have been to some of the intersections where we have some sight distance and try to do some weed eating to at least get those spots done, but we will complete another round. I appreciate it. Anybody else have anything for Brian? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Jones. Go ahead. Um, hi, Brian. Hi there. Nice to have you with us. Just a couple quick questions. I was going to ask about scrugs. I think you just answered that in terms of mowing. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what the status is of, um, I think you guys undertook looking at those um, those rumble lines in, in in my district I haven't seen the disposition on that yet is there a report ready yeah actually I could share some information with you I didn't bring it with me here today okay. but I can share some uh, location information with you okay I'd be glad to do that through maybe mr. Whitlow and get you an email um, but the short of it is is we I know have uh, some recent paving that's been done. So those areas ought to be eligible for us to put those centerline rumble strips in. Um, but I'll get you more information on that. Is it good news or bad news? No, it's good news. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they actually recommended the centerline rumble strips. Great, great. And the only other thing I had was, um, is there a status on the Lost Mountain Road project? Um, as far as the intersection? The yeah, roundabout. I mean, I know it was an engineering, right? Yes, ma'am. It's yeah. still an engineering. Um, I think we have a, um, a meeting coming up on that maybe later this week. Okay. So, yes, it's, it's in progress. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Mr. Chairman, well, I appreciate everything you're doing up in Callaway. Yes, sir. I don't know if I can get home or not, but I <laughs> <laughs> If you have any trouble, give me a call. Uh, well, <laughs> well we, it is quite confusing, and it can be, because the route numbers change right there in Callaway, yeah. Callaway Road, but it's 602, 641. So trying to get those signs out there to not be overly confusing was a little challenge. I believe you got it marked pretty good. Great. Oh, uh, what is the status on the NAF Road that we you? requested it's still in our traffic engineering section being reviewed okay. it usually ideas? takes several months before we can get once we submit it so I know we had submitted oh after the meeting before last I believe the traffic study uh, so it can take upwards of four to six months to complete it just depends on where it is in their queue but I'll keep you updated on that appreciate you. Thank yes you. sir anyone else have anything for Brian don't see anyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Okay, moving to the other Brian, Brian Carter. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Mr. Whitlow. So, yeah, we have two Brian's and two Mr. Carters, and so sometimes it <laughs> gets a little confusing. So, the. Um, for the first item, I have three items, so I apologize. I'll try not to wear out my welcome. Uh, the first item is our monthly finance report. And so this will be for data through September 30th, so a quarter of the fiscal year, 25% uh, is what we would be anticipating. So to look at your general fund, your overview, uh, basically we're, um, we're, we're pretty much in the benchmark of what we'd expect. One thing that I want to watch closely is your other local taxes is at 24.7% of budget. So it's below the 25% benchmark. That is our monthly taxes where sales tax, meals, and occupancy taxes are, are, are reported. So the monthly taxes that are more indicative of the economy are trailing a little bit as a percent of budget. Very, very slight, and so not a, a cause for concern but something we want to watch. And of course, property taxes uh, will be due uh, upcoming, so you'll see that number jump fairly significantly as we get to the December 5th, towards the December 5th due date. On the expenditure side, uh, all, all of ours are at 25% or below. The only one that is not is that general and financial administration, and that's the same cause that it typically is with insurance and a lot of maintenance service contracts, information technology, all of those that are, are paid up front at the start of the year. So to graphically show that, you can see uh, on the revenue, uh, slightly uh, increase year over year, just, just barely. Show that a little bit more in the, the significant categories that make up our budget. 
You can see general property taxes slightly ahead of where they were this time last year. Uh, other local taxes is actually ahead a little bit of where they were last year, so we're still collecting well. I'll show you a little bit that breakdown. It's, it's tightening, though, from where it has been in prior years. And revenue from the Commonwealth, uh, that's still a big driver of that. We well, actually a little bit extra money from the Compensation Board with some increased funding that the state came through for our constitutional officers. Uh, we budgeted for that, but that's an increase year over year in the actual. Uh, but the biggest driver of that is our CSA uh, reimbursement, which means we also spent more money in order to get reimbursed from the state. So have a little bit more detail on that as well. So local sales tax, year over year through September, it's uh, almost $76,000 of an increase. That's 3.6%. So, uh, so it is an increase, but as you can tell, it's, it's a lot tighter if you look at two years ago. And so now for us, we're at almost 28% of budgets. So that's above our 25% benchmark. So we're, we're looking okay, and, and you, as you'll notice, the, we're two months behind on sales tax, if you'll remember, because the state collects it and then processes back to the county. So the peak would be February, but that will be December sales, and so we're still trending okay, as opposed to occupancy tax, where the peak is in the summer, where people are vacationing. Meals tax is actually down a little bit, almost $2,700 from year over year from where we were last year. That's about a half a percent decrease. Uh, we had a good month. It was further behind through August, and so through September we caught up a little bit. Uh, that's still 33.47% of budget, so again, ahead of that 25% benchmark. So from a county budget standpoint, we're doing just fine. Transient occupancy, uh, seesaws, as you can tell from the graph, uh, year over year. And so it's been a little bit more uh, consistent for the first quarter of this fiscal year. You could see kind of this, this line here uh, that's moving up. And so um, not, a, not the big swings we saw the prior two years. And so that, that September collection also helped because it was further behind. So that's about 26000 above where we were uh, at this point in time last year, 15.7%. And it is trending at 45%, well ahead of budget. Uh, what we would anticipate, as you'll notice, is the decline as we go into the colder months. So even though it's 45% of budget right now, that number is going to come closer to equalizing as we get to the slower period. Okay. So for general fund expenditures, we had a, a low month in August. We had an increase in September. A lot of that appears to be timing of the transfers for school operations and county and also just some of the monthly uh, accounts payable invoices that we pay. There doesn't seem to be any significant trend on what's driving that up. It was down last month, just up this month, but not a significant concern at this point. As we noted, all of our expenditure categories are below budget where we would expect them to be this point in time in the fiscal year. Categorically, to show that to you so you can see the increases, uh, public safety and health and welfare, which typically are where we see them, that's also the greatest uh, percent of our budget, as you'd expect. And so we would expect some level of increase. We did fund increases in the budget, uh, personnel, some additional costs uh, for maintenance, fuel, some of those items. Uh, for health and welfare, I'm going to break that down a little bit. Biggest driver of that is CSA. Don't panic. Uh, the, the biggest chunk of that is a timing with the audit and the year-end adjustments. And so... For the October reporting period, that should correct itself somewhat. Uh, what we are seeing, though, is still an increased trend in CSA. We don't see that subsiding. It's a statewide issue. Uh, and so the same um, shortages in facilities uh, or, or the lack of choice in a sense of where our kids, the same complexity of the cases, uh, we're still seeing. And so, you know, the state has made a big push on learning loss. Well, that equates to other behaviors and things in the classroom as well that may go to a private day environment or where uh, you might have a foster care environment, residential environment. And so those are still driving our program. So fund balance uh, updated slightly from last month. And so these are still unaudited. The auditors were here last week. Uh, seem to be, based on comments, a good audit. We should have a final report for you uh, by the December meeting. Maybe November, but I would say probably the December meeting. So when we look at our, our right now, our unassigned fund balance is about $47.8 million. 
We back out the uh, rollovers that were approved or the funding that was approved at last month's meeting, the anticipated school year-end surplus, which is a lot less than it has been in prior years as ESSER funds have expired. So um, the um, at $100 million school budget, you know, there was about $367,000 in cash remaining. And so that, that's cutting it pretty close. And so I'm um, certainly made, made use of the, uh, the dollars. Um, that they're allocated. We have our 20% minimum, so that's based on the estimated collections of revenues based on prior fiscal years. That's just over 24 million. So above our policy minimum is about 20.9 million right now that we would have in our unassigned fund balance. And so, and that would be consistent where we would expect. If you remember that 40-ish, 45, $47 million number, it's pretty consistent with what other localities have around us when Davenport provided that benchmark analysis. So. Uh, it's a good uh, barometer for that. We're, we're pretty consistent with what our others are doing and uh, certainly has improved our, our standing for the financial of the rating agencies. Okay, We still have our budget stabilization of a million dollars and our capital reserve is still sitting at $745,000. And so economic update, uh, the CPI did increase 2.4% in September. It's getting closer to that 2% benchmark rate. Uh, the, but the, the struggle is core inflation increased 3.3%. And so it, that, and when it says core inflation, that excludes food and energy. Uh, so you're really talking uh, housing prices. That's driving that. Some transportation, uh, so, some automobile, uh, if I remember from the last month report, but mostly housing prices. And so we're still seeing the log jam with the higher interest rates uh, and the unaffordability of the housing market. It's just not enough supply. The unemployment rate was 4.1% nationally. It's lower in the Commonwealth. Um, and so that, that we're still, there was an unanticipated bump in uh, job growth in uh, September uh, from the loss that was in August. Federal Reserve did act. They reduced their benchmark rate by half of a percentage point. Pretty, pretty significant reduction. And so the, the average rate right now, uh, they're, they're, Benchmark rate anticipated is about 4.75 to 5 percent. I made a couple notes. I want to make sure I got. And so, of course, what that means, it's not directly correlated, but at a 4.75 to 5 percent target rate, eventually that means the interest rate on our investments will start to come down. And so, um, what we're looking at right now looks to be just under 5% was the interest rate on most of our deposits with Carter Bank. It was just that little over 5% with the local government investment pool that we also invest in. So benchmark right now, we're, we're about the upper end of what the Fed, Federal Reserve's benchmark rate would be. So just keep in mind, um, for the operating budget, we budgeted and anticipated a 3.5% interest rate. So we're still a percentage and a half away from action that the Federal Reserve can take over the course of this fiscal year in the next three quarters before we may be in a concerning situation to have to make up interest income. So even though they're dropping it, it was anticipated, staff planned for that, and the, the budgeted interest rate on our deposits is still well below where it is at this point in time. We'll continue to watch the next Federal Reserve meeting uh, or the Open Market Committee, which is the, the part piece of the Federal Reserve that sets the rate, the benchmark rate, is November 6th and 7th, so we'll have an update for you at the November meeting if they take further action. There was a planned at their September meeting um, reduction of the interest rate three or four times over the next kind of 12, 18 months was the plan. So all that's um, going to be um, driven by what's going on in the marketplace. And so with that, that is what I have for the um, finance report. Be happy to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions for Brian? Question, Go ahead. Vice Chair. Brian, thank you for everything, uh, your presentation. Just a question. Um, how do we internally accrue our interest income? Is it on a monthly basis or quarterly basis? Monthly basis. It's monthly. It is, yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Because I know... In the past, we've used interest income year before last to balance the budget. Yes. Um, and so where is that income setting on a monthly basis in the interim during the year? Pardon me. I'll get to it. Okay. 
So our interest income is essentially the revenue from the use of money and property. It's 98% of that balance. There's some rent uh, that we that we collect, tower rent, leases, and so some of that nature. The vast majority of that budgeted number of the, the um, 2189040 is, is interest income. And so we're sitting at 35% over the, you know, we would anticipate at least 25%. So basically, as that is deposited monthly or collected monthly um, from Carter Bank, that is posted to our bank account or to our general fund. And so that $766,349 that you see the year-to-date revenues, if I could get this working again right there, that is pretty much our interest income. I have a wild question to ask. Yes, ma'am. Is there any um, merit to a suggestion that we use or redirect our interest income to our capital reserve? Is movement of that money possible and recommended? So I would not. So what we did, um, we did have some extra excess earnings, of course, last fiscal year. So if you remember, part of that year in surplus was driven by extra interest earnings. And we did direct that, recommend, and the board did approve directing a lot of that to capital last month. Uh, I would say yes. I would say one thing to keep in mind is this interest is really only Carter Bank. It is not the LGIP interest on the $20 million. Um, Davenport is coming next month. We actually have been in discussions with Davenport on some planned uses for the interest on that LGIP investment for capital needs. So I think, Ms. Smith, you're, you're, um, you've got a good, uh, you're ahead of the game for what we're probably going to be bringing next month. But staff does anticipate and thinks it would be a good use of some of these interest earnings to um, help supplement capital because we know that's a funding need for us. Yeah, thank you for answering that, Brian. And I would just encourage the board um, to think in those terms, um, given that we've had a recent evaluation of our CIP and um, the seriousness at which we're moving on our designated growth areas and so forth. I think the interest income is a place to go while we have it um, to redirect uh, into the capital reserve um, to help us along where we took those extra two cents off the tax rate um, back earlier uh, to adopt the budget. And I think that would help us recover at least in the interim Uh, while we're uh, yielding those types of levels of interest. So, um, Brian, thank you for for sharing that, and I very much look forward to learning more about your recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Yes, we are certainly looking to maximize every dollar we can for that exact reason. Thank Uh, you very much. Fiscal conservative. Thank you. Appreciate it. Moving right along. Okay. All right. The Occasional Engineering Services RFP Award? Yes, sir. And so I do not have a presentation for that. It is executive summary in your agenda booklets. And you should have an amended summary that has a red stamp on it, updated today, October 15th. So um, basically the, the reason for that is the, the responses to the request for proposals were not due until Friday at 1 o'clock. And so that was after the cutoff for the agenda packet. So we really updated those for you. That's most of the changes that were from what you already have in your agenda booklet. So uh, what occasional services are considered? Really, the another name for that is on call. And so our procurement policy requires us, after you reach certain dollar thresholds, to obtain quotes or to go out to bid or, or request for proposals, depending on that level. And so sometimes there are projects that uh, maybe it's an emergency. Maybe it's uh, you know an HVAC repair broken down, or or maybe it's a smaller project that needs some engineering. But if you it's under a tight deadline, and if we need to go for an RFP, that delays it another 30, 60, even 90 days, depending on the process. So a tool that local governments have, or what's called occasional services or on call, this is specific to engineering, architecture engineering. And so there's some planning in there. There's also some surveying. So it was a little comprehensive in the RFP that was advertised. This is the second time we had an original RFP. It was advertised in 2019. It was for five years or, or five one-year contracts. So at any point that one year, you could re, uh, rebid it or reissue the RFP if you wanted to. So that the last co- renewal ends October 31st. So it was time again, the regular cycle of procuring for services uh, to go back out. 
And so we did that. We pretty much uh, reissued the same request for proposals. We did, um, as of the current contract, we have 14 companies that we contract with. Uh, we actually had 24 responses to this RFP, and that list is on page two of your executive summary as far as who, um, who proposed. Most are local, regional. Uh, there are a few out of state, some areas. Um, a lot are ones that we've either used in the past, we have a relationship with, or, or we, uh, we know and would like to at least have on the list for possible work. So I think we're very familiar with this list. Uh, as far as the, um, the I would like to read the note, which is that um, no firm is guaranteed any work. So what would happen at this process is we're going to request the board to award, uh, to award all 24 because it obligates us for nothing. And I think from the flexibility that it provides staff, what's going to happen in the next steps are we have a standard contract that we provide to each of these firms. Mr. Gwen's office has already approved that from previous, and so we work through his office again to make sure all the wording is still acceptable. We send that out to the firms. They send back. Sometimes they're back and forth. They accept all the terms of it. Once we have the contract, they will also submit a fee schedule. So essentially, if you have multiple firms, 24 in this case, we have 24 people competing against each other with their fee schedules to try and obtain any of the county work doesn't obligate us to use them. What we would be looking for, it's another five-year contract, but it's five one-year terms. So what we would do is we would ask the board to award it for the five years, but in those one-year term increments. So what staff would do is we would go through a renewal process at every one-year um, anniversary of that renewal date. And then we would get a new fee schedule. We would negotiate. If uh, costs increase, we would have the flexibility to switch to a different firm if we needed some work done. Um, the other thing that it will allow us, if all of them came in, we, we're not obligated, so we can reissue the RFP and try and, and recognize some additional savings through competition. Uh, basically, the, um, there is no additional budget asked for the board. If the project, uh, if any of these services are utilized, funding will either have to come through their existing departmental budget, whether that's operating or capital, depending on the need, or um, Mr. Whitlow or, or county administration will bring that request to you for additional funding. It would have to be approved by the board to move forward at that point. But the, the only thing we're really doing at this point is awarding the RFP to those who proposed so that staff can then follow up with a contract, and then as needed, uh, we would use them as projects and the, as the county budget allows. So okay. that's the overall synopsis of what staff is asking for. We have some, uh, some possible board actions, but certainly be happy to go into a little more detail or answer any questions of the board. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Brian? I'm sorry, okay. I do. Uh, I oh, got Dan first. Good, Mr. Quinn, please. Oh. So Brian, uh, two questions. Do you have a feel for how much money you spend through this contract vehicle annually, roughly? I do not have a feel uh, for the annual spend uh, because there's just multiple firms. So the problem we run into is some of the same firms have separate bids for us on other projects. And so uh, it would be a little bit more difficult for us to track all that. Uh, it depends. It, it ebbs and flows on the project. And so I know some of the members of the team that did the review could probably speak to specific projects. Mm. So one thing that is in our policy, Mr. Quinn, is we have an $80,000 annual cap per project that's in our procurement code. So per each of the firms, the 14 that we have under contract now, we cannot spend more than $80,000 with either one of them. Mm. Okay. And then the, the second question, if you have one of these occasional services that comes up, and you have multiple contractors on the list that can do the work, do you get informal quotes from them or do you just pick one and give it to one or how does that work? This is a very decentralized process. So what I would say is typically the department manages that and that's gonna depend on the department running the project. Um, mm -hmm. I would say my preference would be yes, um, that we would reach out to multiple firms. Uh, but you, you're going to know because of the fee schedule what their hourly rate is. So even ahead of time, you're pretty much going to know what it's going to cost you. The only thing that may vary is the estimated hours that it may, um, it, it, that each firm may anticipate to complete the work. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Supervisor Smith. 
Dan asks my two questions. For okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. No other questions. We need a motion on this. Board, what's your pleasure? We well, got one more question. Okay. Ryan, where do you who decide? You said it goes back to the department as to who picks these. Typically, it's very decentralized. Once we have the award, the departments know their needs better, so they will spec out the project, and they will work with the various firms that they're authorized to work with. Yes, sir. Okay. It doesn't come through a central approval process in finance uh, or administration at that point. It would just be, obviously, for budget perspectives, each administrative staff member over that department would make sure the funds were available but it's not a, a centralized review as far as who authorizes the use of the contract. The type of the project, uh, you know, was it a small, large? I mean, it, it's, if the department picks somebody, do they get your okay, get the department's okay from it? They would from a yeah. budgetary perspective to make sure that they had the money, uh, but we are not contacted to say, I would like to use, for example, Timmons Group for X such project. That's not something that is centrally managed. Yes, sir. Some of these, I mean, I, I'm assuming they know whether to get an architect or engineer one, right? Or A and E, depending on the size of the job. That's what I'm getting at. Yes. Uh, well, and you know, if the uh, job is large enough, of course, we'll go out for a separate RFP. But yeah, depending on the size of the job, what we will have are those fee schedules, and each of these companies course have different services that they offer so your specific was a and e so you're correct so we would have a staff a list of a and e firms we have historically used of course that we had a good experience with or bad experience with so I'm not saying that may not play a factor in what the decision may be but each department would have access to the fee schedule every year when we renew and then they would look to see what would fit in their budget and what would work with their need and then they would make that decision to to request the services thank you yes sir Randy, this might be a question for you. <clears throat> that um, presentation we were given, it was last year, it was a uh, designation of um, capital improvement projects about the different buildings and stuff. Was that group one of these listed here? Uh, are you referring to the facilities master plan? Yes. Yes, that was Spectrum Design. Okay. Yes, sir. I don't really have a question, Mr. Chairman, more of a comment that uh, – a lot of our departments have a whole lot of bright minds, and I know that a lot of times we're required to do these studies and stuff, but some of these studies that I've sat and watched um, unfold weren't worth the paper they were written on. And uh, I would um, express to county departments that if you think you have a good idea and you got people who are smart enough to do it, just do it. And don't spend taxpayer money on some of these studies. That's my only comment. Anyone else have anything? Okay, board, what's your pleasure on this? There's a motion included in the executive summary. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to award the occasional services RFP to the selected firms and to authorize the county administrator or designee in consultation with the county attorney to execute agreements with such firms noted for planning, architectural engineering, construction support, surveying occasional services for the next five years as presented in this summary. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion before we take a final vote? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Supervisor Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. And Chairman Thompson is absent for the vote. Okay. All right. Mr. Carter, now the Benefits Consultant Services RFP? Yes, sir. Thank you. So. Uh, we do um, periodically, it's best practice to, of course, procure for services. Um, and so we, we have been about a little over 10 years since we last procured our benefits consultant. And so this would be the consultant that works with county staff for a lot of our, our insurances, our health insurance, our dental insurance, um, our voluntary benefits. And so they are pretty much what's considered the insurance broker. So they go between us and our insurance provider for example, Anthem for our health plan to negotiate the best rate. They get uh, data on claims experience. They provide an analysis to staff on where claims are trending. So when we come to you every year and say claims are bad, we're going to need a 10% increase in our health insurance plan. 
the broker, this consultant firm are the ones that perform that work and, and advise staff on what would be the best course of action to mitigate the increases and how to best manage our, our plans, our insurance plans. So we've had for 10 years, it was Wells Fargo company name bought out and changed to USI Insurance Services. So being as it was over 10 years since we had used them, last procured their services, we issued a separate request for proposals for benefit consulting. So we received eight responses, and um, we decided to interview four of those eight after staff from Administration Finance Human Resources reviewed the proposals. And so those four that we interviewed were USI Insurance Services, the incumbent, um, the One Digital, and uh, Pierce Group, and Mark III. And so those were the, the four highest rated that we interviewed. And ultimately, when we, uh, when we came down to it, uh, staff did recommend, uh, is recommending a change in our insurance consultant. It's not because of services, but uh, frankly, uh, I think any of the four firms we interviewed would do just fine for what the county needs. They were all qualified, uh, all certainly uh, capable. Uh, ultimately, it came down to cost, and so the, the lowest price was, uh, was Pierce Group Benefits and an annual cost of $29,000. Uh, right now, uh, we pay about 40000 so that's about $11,000 uh, less and so within our current contract and so but um, it was still about nine thousand dollars less than the next lowest annual cost and so what we were able to procure this contract was a three-year contract and we were able to lock in we would be able to lock in that cost of twenty nine thousand dollars for three years so essentially that's about a thirty three thousand dollar savings over the life of the contract from what we're paying today and uh, then we would have the option for two one-year renewals. Uh, even with the three-year contract, uh, there would be a provision in the contract uh, for, if it just, it just wasn't working, we would probably give somewhere between a 30, 60, or 90-day notice and reissue an RFP for additional services. So uh, it's something that staff looked at seriously because we, as a general rule, there is a, a process when you change a provider that of course is work uh, on staff and, and there could be some some dynamic there as we go through that process what that looks like should not be an impact to the employee uh, certainly staff will work to mitigate that but when we look at the decrease in price based on what we felt like the, the benefits we would be getting uh, reference checks were, were very good uh, we had a lot of these companies have local clients that are around us and so we had some very good reference checks felt very reliable on them the other thing that we've got to look forward is this is the last year of our medical contract. So whoever we bring on board is immediately going to have to be working on a request for proposals for new health insurance. And so we felt like any of the four would be capable of doing that, certainly have done it in their vast list of clients. So for us, it came down to, well, that the best deal for the Franklin County taxpayer was Pierce Group Benefits. And so that's the, the recommendation of staff. Certainly happy to answer any board questions and um, look forward to a motion if so desire. Any questions? Go ahead. Brian, uh, thank you for this information. I just have a couple questions. Yes, ma'am. Are compliance services and day-to-day -day services part of the scope of this RFP and yeah. the award, potential award? Yes, ma'am. Compliance services as far as uh, federal labor law and insurance, the new like Affordable Care Act and all of those items, uh, assuming you'd be anticipated. But yes, that, that was part of the criteria for the request for proposals, and that would be part of any contract. What about day-to-day -day services for the employees, where they can pick the phone up and call? We would have a, um, any of these have a service center. They vary depending on what. Uh, we're very uh, particular about that as far as staff goes, that it has to be typically local or at least U.S.-based for our employees to have access. Um, I will say, Ms. Smith, that for the most part, our employees come to our human resources and payroll staff. They don't call an 800 number. So it's important for us as staff that we are comfortable with our account executive mm -hmm. that we can call and get our employees answers to their questions. That makes sense. Um, but both options are, are there. And so we would the have other, that The only other question I had, are the commissions embedded? <clears throat> so there are no commissions for, um, for the, the staple insurance benefits, health, dental, vision. There are commissions for voluntary, and that was across the board for all other respondents. So uh, one of the things that we as staff 
uh, or monitor very closely when we have involuntary benefits or things like your cancer insurance, critical illness, hospital indemnity, those type things, a short-term disability. So um, we uh, right now we have UNUM. That, that's not part of this award. That's, of course, a separate insurance carrier. That process will be coming up in the next year or two for a renewal, probably a reissuance of an RFP. But this broker would work on that for us. And um, I think, you know, that, that's part of, that was one of the bigger things we were looking at as part of our process of what is each, any carrier, any broker that we would select, what's your process with commissions and voluntary benefits? You want you working for us, not for the commission. And so um, we felt like with any of them, really, um, that we were pretty satisfied with their response. But um, the, the big insurance, especially the medical that drives our costs, according to at least what they what they presented to us and what we were able to research on our own is that there's no commission based on your, your major medical, dental, and vision products. So this is an apples to apples switch between consultants with USI. The offerings would still be equitable with the, the offerings. Firm. We feel they would be for what we use. And so, yeah, bigger firms may have a lot of fancy products. Um, we just haven't used them. Uh, and so that probably was the case with USI. Um, I think we as a committee went around and, and just said, well, what do, do any of these firms offer that would justify the cost? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's about value for the dollar. And so when we looked at the core services that we would need, it looked to be that all were equally uh, prepared and capable. And so ultimately, it came down to, okay, well, who can do it for the most value, which is the lowest cost? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Queen. Uh, Brian, so this reminds me that I didn't like the acquisition strategy we had for the um, the benefits plan in that we put it out to bid and the first year was very competitive, but in the four forward years, we were really at the mercy of the provider. And I, and I understand the reluctance to go out to bid every year because it's a lot of work issuing that RFP. Mm -hmm. But it made me think that there are probably some metrics that we could have for those forward years so that the forward years are not a negotiated deal every year, but instead you look at the, the metrics that you put in place and you know exactly what your rate will be in the forward years. And, and so this company has a lot of experience with the 30 other counties and 100 school systems. And I can't imagine that they're following this similar strategy that we have. I, I would think that they would be looking at, at other ways to, to bid out the, their work. And so it'll be really interesting, I think, to get them, well, to get their point of view early on in, in terms of what best practices are for bidding out our benefits. Right. Yeah, and so, and we'll certainly ask that. You know, our previous, um, currently, our USI recommends and the guidance that we have received is, uh, and this is just what I've seen in the local government industry, um, you start to lose competition because a lot of these insurance providers, specifically medical, they don't bid on one year. The volume's not there. The, uh, they bid on two, three, four-year contracts. And so the advice to us from our current consultant was, you really only have two providers in this marketplace that has the network, and that's Anthem and Aetna. And so if you if, you, if they can't make it cost competitive, neither one of them are going to bid, and then we're, we're stuck. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the advice we heeded with USI. Uh, I think certainly with a change in provider, we're going to, as I mentioned, Mr. Quinn, it's time for a request for proposals for medical. So I think we are going to look at the best contract we can negotiate that allows us the flexibility to save as much money as we can on those, give us as much leverage as we can possibly obtain. I know. And so when I think about metrics for the Ford year, you know, they all they always look at claims history. Right. Yes. So they look, what did you do last year? And that becomes a big component of what your rate is going to be for the Ford year. So that's fine. That's a, that's very fair to have that metric be part of the equation for what the rates will be in the next year are is your claim history in the prior year and then there are probably others you know maybe there's like a cpi for medical you know somewhere or and and you could have a, a whole formula that said okay this is what we pay the first year but here's the formula to pay to for years two through five certainly yeah we will be happy to to ask that anyone else Okay, this requires uh, a motion as well. Board, what's your pleasure? J. 
Chairman, I make a motion we award the benefits constant uh, RFP to Pierce Group benefits for a three-year contract from November 1, 2024 to October 31st, 2027. I authorize the county administrator, county attorney, and deputy county administrator to sign all necessary documents to award the RFP and resulting contract. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion before we take a final vote? Okay, Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Supervisor Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. And Chairman Thompson's absent for the vote. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Mr. Sandy. Yeah, thank you. Brian took all my time, so I'll have to be quick. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's our fault. <laughs> this is really primarily as a way of an update. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the, the recent hurricanes and, and flooding and so forth, and so kind of timely in that sense that uh, FEMA has undertaken a study of our area. Uh, and I just put this, this slide up just to show some of the other localities they're looking at. Um, kind of together in the same watershed. And so they've been uh, started a process where they studied our existing uh, area and the existing flood maps, and they're proposing some uh, changes to our maps. Our maps have been, uh, have not been updated since 2008 uh, and 2010 uh, is the last time that our maps were updated. So it's, it, it is something that's really, you know, due and it's something they should uh, be looking at to update. Um, I'll go back just a little bit to talk about really what we're talking about is the flood insurance rate maps. And so uh, in Franklin County, we've had them since 1981, flood insurance rate maps. So we've been a participating community, uh, whereas anyone that has a federally backed mortgage will get, be able to get flood insurance through this program. And in fact, are required to get flood insurance through this program. But if, even if you don't have a federally backed mortgage, you can still get it. Um, through uh, the, the FEMA program. And so, again, those have been in place since 1981. They've been updated a, a couple times through the years. Again, most recently, 2010 uh, was our last update. And so, um, recently, uh, staff from the various localities you see on the screen there were given an update from the consultant, some of the work that's been done recently and some of the suspected kind of impacts or changes. And so just wanted to give you kind of a quick briefing on that. Uh, we're kind of at the, really at the early beginning parts of the stages. So over the next several months to a year, we'll be going through this process where they fine tune those, uh, any changes to the maps before those maps are officially adopted. And then those are the maps that mortgage lenders and realtors and, and insurance folks will be looking at to make determinations uh, about whether a property is in the floodplain or out of the floodplain. So again, what they studied was really this uh, upper Roanoke River and, and really the Roanoke River uh, basin, which includes Pennsylvania, Bedford, Campbell, uh, Franklin, Roanoke County, Roanoke City, and I believe Salem as well, at least a portion of Salem. Um, so this was just kind of a breakdown. Uh, zone e AE, when it refers to that, that's, that's the, it's considered a floodplain, but it has actual elevation. So the E stands for elevation. Zone A is just considered floodplain, but it does not have elevations attached to it. And so uh, this is just really a brief snapshot of kind of what they studied through this project. Um, again, just some additional information of the miles uh, of, of stream. So for us, um, they restudied. Um, a total of 72 miles and they uh, Restudied zone a 387 and they redelineated 40 miles and so you can see just as a comparison to, to Pennsylvania County studied less but actually redelineated more uh, Again just kind of the same thing. I just went over uh, just for Franklin County specific And again Franklin County specific uh, what was the the focus area there really the entire county for us because um, and so here, what they provided also was just kind of a, a snapshot or a dashboard of some information. Um, and these were in your packet. Uh, but, you know, just a few things that we can look at is, is here, it looks at repetitive losses. So that's one of the main things they look at is those properties 
especially now with hurricanes and those properties where they're continuing to have it to pay and pay and pay every time there's an event, uh, they track that. And of course, your, your insurance is going to uh, go up. But really, with all these and all these events, it's really affecting all of our insurance. It's, it's going to um, really. So, um, but this kind of gives a snapshot of, of those claims that have been paid. Uh, the number of policies. So here there's 100 uh, flood insurance policies in, in place in the county. And again, these are required for federally backed mortgage. So if you don't have a federally backed mortgage, you don't have to do this. Um, and, and so this is a, a snapshot, 660 estimated structures uh, in the flood hazard area. I draw your attention to the kind of the bottom right is, is kind of the impact of this study is that they're estimating there's going to be 145 structures that will now be considered in the floodplain that previously were not. Um, and then they took out 50, so we have a net of about 100 um, plus or minus that, based on what they're proposing, will, will now be in the uh, floodplain. They also did it for Boone's Mill, obviously uh, much smaller, uh, but, but Boone's Mill has a significant floodplain area uh, as the, the river stream flows right through there. Uh, they also did it for Rocky Mount, which uh, kind of has less um, floodplain impacts. And then they broke it down to just the unincorporated area as well. So just, just some snapshots of, of that. Um, the FEMA Map Center is, is really where information can be found about any locality in the country as far as their FEMA maps. You can look them up. So for the public that is curious about um, the maps and where to find them and any information about revisions, this FEMA map uh, flood center, or FEMA map service center, uh, would be the place to go to find that information. And as we uh, move through this process, there'll also be a, a community or public engagement process that'll be part of this prior to those maps becoming official um, from FEMA. Now, I should say we're allowed to comment on these, and, and that's where I'm going to go with this whole uh, discussion. But really, in the end, it's FEMA who decides. Uh, you know what these maps look like who's in the floodplain and who's not um, that's really a, these are fema federal maps federal insurance maps and so kind of it is important for us to to comment obviously and, and express any concerns we have but i guess what i'm saying is we have little control over the final outcome of of these maps so um, locally or, or statewide, DCR uh, is Department of Conservation and Recreation. They're kind of the, the state entity that kind of manages the floodplain. And so here's a link as well to the Virginia Flood Risk Information System. Uh, again, if, if people are looking for more information about uh, flood mapping and, and floodplains, this would be the place to go. So really all of this point, points toward floodplains management and protecting structures uh, from you know, uh, flooding events, hurricanes, uh, whatever it may be in our area, it's more river river flooding. Um, and so just a couple of notes to, to point out is that communities must regulate uh, based on these flood firms as flood insurance rate maps. Um, development should be reasonably safe from flooding. So as we review building permits and other development proposals here at the county, we're looking at these maps to determine if they fall in one of these designated areas. Based on that, there are certain requirements uh, for building. Uh, if you're in a flood zone, you're not uh, actually able to, to build a habitable structure except under very limited circumstances. And so, um, again, just reflecting back on some of the recent incidents that have happened now, I think uh, the North Carolina examples maybe are, 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 are extreme examples, uh, but generally we're, we're trying to get buildings away from those rivers and away from those creeks getting them elevated up so when we do see those increased uh, water levels that these properties are protected. Now, I don't know what they considered those storms in North Carolina, but um, I would say that there was probably some that uh, never thought they would see water, I'm sure, um, that, that did in that case. But we, we do try to manage uh, as best we can in these floodplain potentially uh, areas. Um, we want to elevate them and we want to do different things with the mechanical systems and electrical systems to, to try to alleviate any impacts uh, on the structures. So again, I just mentioned briefly kind of about the timeline, but this is kind of the timeline that they sent us. Uh, so we are really, uh, the, the, the meeting was in this area, 
or here, I'm sorry, the meeting was in this area. What they've told us is we have 30 days to respond with, with comments to these maps, initial comments from the county. Uh, so that's the period we're in, and that period ends on October 25th. Um, staff has a, we have a group of staff folks who are looking over these maps and kind of generating some of those comments. Uh, we have some specific comments, but there's also some general comments, and I'll just kind of jump into those. One is one big one is Smith Mountain Lake. Um, Smith Mountain Lake is uh, properties along the lake do fall in the floodplain, and so um, lots of those properties, uh, and many of you are familiar with those. Lots of those properties, those the structures are well above the lake. However, because part of their property falls in the floodplain and it touches the lake. A lot of those property owners have to uh, go through a process of disputing that their house is outside of uh, a flood hazard and so they have to either hire an engineer or a surveyor in most cases to go out and fill out a form uh, or do a letter what's called a letter of map amendment to change the actual map to show that their structure is outside of any uh, designated flood area and it, once they do that formal process they don't have to pay for flood insurance. Um, some people won't go through that process, they'll just go ahead and pay the flood insurance, figuring it's, it's probably just cheaper to do it that way. So there are processes that come into place, but where we see um, a, a, a big impact is at the lake. And, and one of the things we're questioning as a staff is, is what those elevations are. So I'll throw out some numbers, but, but full pond at the lake is 795, 790 feet uh, elevation. The study area and the, the project boundary area is 800 feet above sea level, or 800 feet contour. Where they currently have our floodplain designated is 802.2. So 802 feet point two uh, is, is where they say the flood limit is. Um, so that does obviously have an impact on property owners. So property owners at the lake are already restricted below 800. They cannot build below the 800 foot contour. But if they're within that 802.2, they still will be subject to flood insurance. I don't know how those numbers have come to be. I don't know why they exist the way they exist. And, and oddly enough, I was telling uh, Supervisor uh, Smith is I didn't know until last week that Bedford County's uh, base flood elevation is actually different than ours for the lake. I don't know why that is. And so those are some of the comments that, that we're going to generate. Um, maybe some further explanation of those numbers because those numbers do have an impact on our citizens and having to either get flood insurance or, or go through a process to get out of requiring flood insurance. So um, Bedford County's is about half a foot lower than ours. And so I don't know if it tilts or, or what, but uh, I would think the elevation would be the same on both sides of the lake. Um, so those are the sorts of questions that we have is, is how did those numbers come to be? What's the rationale? Why is it higher than 800 if the, if the water, theoretically, the water will never be over 800 feet? Um, and so why are we two and a half feet above that? But those are the sorts of comments that we would like to issue. We do have some specific ones that we've identified as well that we have some questions and concerns about. And so we'll be working to generate a letter with the board's approval and that's really the only motion or action that i was looking for was just uh, either a motion or concurrence to for staff to go ahead and file some of those comments that we have initially um, and get those into fema's hands so maybe they'll make some changes uh, to, to modify those um, and then as i mentioned we'll have another process later where we'll actually have another opportunity for for some feedback um, as we get closer to actually those maps becoming official. So that's really just kind of a quick update and uh, happy to provide any additional information if you need it beyond what was in your packet um, or happy to answer any questions. Right. Anyone Otherwise, any just questions? looking for support for, for a letter to, to send up. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Mr. Sandy, you and I have talked about this. Um, one of the things, and I don't know if it's embedded in staff comments or not, um, we were victim of having to go through this process with FEMA. And my comment is, and it's you guys probably know this, when they have taken 50 lots off of their list, according to the report, um, are they looking at those properties that really are not subject to flooding? Like, for instance, ours was 
for families to have to go through this process is arduous and it's expensive. And I mean, so are, do they just throw everybody in the pot and say, if you've got a federally backed mortgage, you've got to do, you've got to purchase flood insurance unless you can prove through a process otherwise? Yeah, that's generally how it works. Yeah. And so the way it, so the number that you referred to is actually structure. So there's a lot more parcels that are actually Structures, fall right. in the floodplain, but they may yeah. be vacant. Um, and so typically when it's a structure is, is that insurance company or lending agency is going to want to, they're going to want to make you get flood insurance unless, like you <coughs> said, unless you can demonstrate through a process and through a, a, a form that they have, um, that you're outside of, of that area. Um, and so I think what the reason we're seeing additional structures come in is because they're delineating more areas within the floodplain. So areas that previously were not designated as floodplain are now designated. And so that's what, that's really what the 150 structures there are. The, the negative is because there was some nuances and some adjustments in some areas. Um, what they've tried to do as part of this process is kind of true up <coughs> their maps based on better technology and better uh, topographic information. So probably for a, an instance like yours, probably didn't change. I haven't looked specifically at yours, but it probably did not take you out. You're still probably in what's considered uh, the <coughs> floodplain, or at least your parcel is. Yeah, because we're exempted now. Because your, we, your house is likely five to 10 feet above yeah. the flood elevation, but your parcel is still falls within uh, the floodplain. And so a lot of times those lending agencies <coughs> are simply looking at a map that says, oh, parcel XYZ is in the floodplain, so you've got to have flood insurance. I just bring that comment forward as a, a real life example of what's being experienced by residents at the lake. Yeah. And, and anything that you think would be an appropriate remark <laughs> to that end, if you feel it appropriate. That's and, and the other thing with that is, it, I forget the number, there was the number of how many people, 200 and some that have already done what you did, <coughs> uh, is making sure that that information carries forward and that those, you know, as those maps change, that you're not having the same, let's say you refinanced, that you're not having to go through that process again. And so making sure that that information kind of moves forward is also something where, you know, we want to make sure that the, the dollars that people had to spend, that they didn't kind of waste it, that it's still valid. Um, and, and then again, that big discrepancy, I think, between Bedford and, and Franklin as far as the elevation, um, you know, it's only like half a foot, but it's still half a foot, and it's half a foot less. So in my opinion, we should at least be the same as that. Um, but I really think it should be lower, um, you know, lower than that. Will you bring a report back? We'll, we'll provide a copy of down the road when we get some sure yeah further update results. Mm -hmm. yeah okay. and we'll provide a copy of the letter that goes out in the in the Friday packet uh, in the form I'm talking about when FEMA comes back and says this is the this is the end product yes yeah okay. we can do another update okay at that point. thank you anyone else go ahead Mike J just one comment and you may or may not remember this Steve but I had a constituent it doesn't just affect the lake but I had a constituent that was on the upper end of the Blackwater River up on a very high hill and it was low and they were trying to sell their house and it got held up by the bank because these older maps showed it being in a floodplain and it really wasn't. Do you think these some of these houses or parcels they've taken out, maybe they've addressed those issues? That's that's a lot of it is, is kind of correcting those technology issues you know obviously they're not doing a physical survey of of all the properties so they're just going off overlaid maps and so yeah that that's supposed to be what some of the refinements are is is kind of fine-tuning some of those issues but you're exactly right you know we've got some river areas where people are 100 feet above the water uh, but their property goes all the way down to the to right. the river and so, so they're also men yep yep okay thank you all right anyone else so I'm hearing no issues with moving forward with a comment letter. Okay. Do you need a motion or a consensus sign? It, there, there's a sample motion in your packet, but yeah, I think just a concurrence is also fine. I see everybody nodding, so go forward. We'll move forward then. All right. This time we're going to take a break. We're going to take about 10 minutes and reconvene back in B75 uh, for our work session. Uh, board, I would suggest that you grab dinner and take it back and uh, 
We'll have dinner back in B-75. And the first will be on a special use permit being filed uh, by Michael and Janet Mercer pertaining to property located at 70 Island Drive. Uh, following that hearing, we'll have a public hearing on the proposed boundary adjustment agreement with the town. Ms. Cooper. Yes. Thank you, Vice um, Chairman Tatum and members of the board. We are here this evening, as you said, for a special use permit for the Mercers. They're the applicants. Their property is zoned R1 Residential Suburban uh, Subdivision District. Um, what they are here for is for a home, second, second single family detached dwelling on a lot. They happen to be located in the Westlake Hales Ford designated growth area and their future land use designation is suburban residential two units per acre. Um, there are no dwellings on the parcel at this time. However, the owner applicant uh, plans to submit building permit applications for this cottage, which will eventually become the second single family detached dwelling on the lot after the main dwelling, which we would consider the primary dwelling is constructed. So along with these two dwellings, he also the Mercers have proposed a workshop garage to be constructed on this property. And the owners will occupy the cottage as um, a second dwelling once they finish construction on the primary structure. The sizes, the cottage will be about 1,500 square feet, two bedrooms, two baths. Um, the main primary dwelling will be close to 6,000 square feet. It'll have four bedrooms, four and a half bathrooms, and the workshop garage will be approximately 3,000 square feet with one bathroom. Um, they would like to construct the cottage first, and the owners will occupy this home, like I said, until their main dwelling is bit, uh, built. They're hoping to pull all the permits and try to do all the construction, especially on the home and the workshop um, at the same time. And they can, uh, the applicant could go into more detail of how they plan to do the construction. They do have a permit from the Virginia Department of Health for six bedroom septic, which would definitely be enough um, a septic system for um, what they need on the property. The property happens to be a corner lot. It's on a state maintained road, Merriman Ro Way Road 666, and Island Drive, which is a private road. Before the Planning Commission public hearing, we did receive one call and one e email requiring about the application. We also received uh, one call concerning about the lack of an HOA in the area as well as a possible subdivision of the property. Um, the Mercers have not talked to our office about subdividing the property and I don't think that is their intention. We like to give you a vicinity map, but before I go to that, I do wanna mention um, at the public hearing for the Planning Commission, we did have five people that spoke um, and all five were against uh, for various reasons from the septic system to um, the subdivision having a water, um, a private water company, um, about the drain field, the size of the workshop and what it might be used for, um, about the different septic systems, would they have to have two or just one drain field? just to give you an idea, and maybe some of those will be here this evening to speak. This is the vicinity map that we like to share. Also, we like to give you an aerial. Um, the property is in the blue. It goes along with um, this subdivision. It, at one time, they were separate lots, but the lots have been uh, combined to make one large lot, about 3.89 acres. Here's Merriman Road, and here's the private road, Island Drive. The, um, <clears throat> the comprehensive plan has this listed as suburban residential, two units per acre. It is in the Westlake um, designated growth area, as I stated prior. It also is uh, zoned R1, 
and you'll notice that most of the property um, or all the property surrounding this is residential. You do have some A1 residential up here. Just in case you didn't go, be able to go see the property, um, one of the planners took some pictures. It just shows the proximity to the, the lake, how large the lot is, and this is the existing boat dock. Um, just as analysis, um, this area is mostly vacant lots or constructed with single family dwellings. The second dwelling uh, would generate a similar amounts of noise and traffic of any single family residence. Um, keep in mind that when you look at the R1 district, we do not think, or the Planning Commission does not think the character of the district would be changed. You have an average lot size anywhere from less to five acres or up to 7,500 square feet. It's probably going to depend on if you have public water and sewer. Uh, regulations in the R1 district are designed to maintain neighborhood sta stability and promote suitable environment for family life, and this use would meet that intent of the district. The second um, dwelling would be in harmony with the purpose and the intent that I just read for the use, especially being single family dwellings. That's what you expect to find in your R1 zoning district. The comprehensive plan would support the different types of dwelling units that are is appropriate use that you find in suburban residential two units, um, residential two units per acre, um, and a second single family would be allowed on this lot. The future land use does um, say that the density could be two to four dwelling units per acre. Therefore, the size of this uh, lot being almost four acres would definitely support the two dwelling units. Just remember that um, you use in accordance to Section 25638 when you're making your decision on a special use permit. And it is all, was also determined that the second dwelling would not be um, substantially detriment to the adjoining property owners for the size of the lot and the second dwelling being a single family dwelling that will be used for family members once the primary structure is built. The Planning Commission held their public hearing. They approved the special use permit with five conditions on a 7-0 vote um, that the special use permit to authorize just this one second dwelling. So in other words, you'll have the main dwelling, the second dwelling, only on the property, if any more residential dwellings shall be built, they would have to come back to through the process. The occupant of the second dwelling, once the primary structure is built, can only be used for family members in accordance to Section 25.232. In reference to Condition 2, the property owner shall reflect this use in an occupancy affidavit approved by the Planning and Community Development Department, and it will be recorded in the Clerk of Circuit Court Office once this dwelling is used as a second dwelling. The second de dwelling shall have its own address that will be clearly visible and displayed for 911 emergency um, services, and the address shall be posted so it's visible from Island Drive as well as the dwelling itself and the applicant and property owner will have to ob obtain all permits for all the structures from the building and the planning department <clears throat> to use and occupy the second dwelling. I would be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for Ms. Cooper? Go ahead, Ms. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one, uh, Ms. Cooper. You said the neighborhood has a water system, but it looks like they have plans for a well is that correct? <clears throat> yes, yes, sir. Somebody spoke about the private, private water company um, so that they wouldn't have to drill, drill a well, but that would be up to the Mercers if they wanted to get on with that private water company. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I'll reserve mine okay. after the public okay. hearing. All right, I don't see anyone else. Are the Mercers here? I think they are. We are. Yes. Okay. Would they like to speak to, in regards okay, to I have a specific so. question? Does anyone have any questions for the Mercer? I don't think so. I don't think anyone does. I just have a big family. Okay. And we have another family that lives in 
Come, come on up. They would be glad to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Will, state your name and address for the record, please. Um, my name is Janet Mercer, the spouse of Mike. And um, the address that we're going to build on is 70 Island Drive. We're currently in a rental in Moneta. And we just have, I have a big family. And part of that family has um, a um, cabin up in um, Minnesota. and. They'll sleep 25 in this cabin and get a whole bunch of family members together, and they really set it up that way. And that generation of our family is um, getting older and not very many of them left anymore. And we talked about this, and I know our neighbors like think we're trying to build too much, but it's our intent to be able to have our family members come and visit us and do a very similar sort of thing for our family. So. Anyway, I just wanted to pass that on. Okay, thank you. So. All right. Uh, right along. We'll open the floor now for public comment. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up for this? Um, I only had the Mercer signed up. Okay. All right. Is anyone here that would like to speak in regard to this zoning request? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the floor for public comment. Okay, board, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome the Mercers. Um, thank you for your application. Um, I just um, just had just a couple few things here. With respect, Ms. Mercer, to your comment about the large family and, you know, over time the family, of course, is getting smaller. Um, can you come up to the podium so... I can make sure that everybody can hear you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, do you envision um, this to look something or behave like a short-term rental? Is no. it is it going to be something that's consistent or is it sporadic holidays? No, it's no, it's intended to be for holiday use. I have a okay. family. It we don't we don't have any intent to do a, a short-term rental. I wouldn't want to get into that business. Well, they're prohibited in, right. in R1, but I just didn't know if, you know, the no, fact it's, that... It's like having family come out to visit for a week or two weeks at a time. Um, I could envision my sister coming out from Colorado, sure. maybe even staying part of the summer with us. Sure. And so, no, it's just family use. Okay. I just wanted to clarify yep. that. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Cooper, would you mind coming up? Um, on the conditions that the Planning Commission have appro has approved, um, I would like to ask uh, my colleagues, um, and I want to ask you about the appropriateness, I would like to add uh, condition number six, which speaks to AEP. Um, on uh, the paragraph above the Commission's recommendation, um, Mr. Holthauser opined on AEP. And, and just clarified the issue about the, um, the S&P and the 800 foot, so forth. Uh, and in number five, we talk about permits from the Franklin County Building and Planning Departments, but we don't say anything about AEP. And if it would be the pleasure of the board, I would like to add a condition six that articulates basically what AEP has said in the development team comments. Do you think that is appropriate in your planning expertise you you could definitely make that con a condition and you could always put that the applicant and owner shall obtain all required permits from Appalachian or AEP yeah and you don't have to list everything that no. you listed we could just do it as simple as that I just want a simple condition but just basically it just looks like to me almost an oversight that we didn't pick up on AEP's comments. And I just would like to add that. Okay. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none. I'll Board, offer a Go motion, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I find that the use will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent properties, that the character of the zoning district will not be changed thereby, and that such use will be in harmony with the uses permitted by right in the zoning district and with the public health, safety, and general welfare to the community. Therefore, I move to recommend approval of the applicant's request for special use permit with 
the amendment of uh, condition number six to articulate AEP's uh, stated position on individual permitting required through AEP uh, and that this be for the purpose of a home and second single family detached dwelling on a lot in accordance with section 25-223 of the zoning ordinance with the <coughs> six conditions recommended oh excuse me that would be with the five conditions recommended by the planning commission okay do we have a second second okay we have a motion and a second to approve this request any further discussion before we take a final vote Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. And Chairman Thompson is absent for the vote. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving right along. Our second hearing tonight is on a proposed boundary adjustment agreement between the county and town of Rocky Mount. Our county attorney, Mr. Jim Gwynn, will begin this hearing. Mr. Gwynn? Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, uh, an agreement that has uh, grown of uh, several agreements that were occurring at the same time with regard to uh, uh, fire safety along with uh, some sewer uh, increased capacity and the like. Um, much of the boundary uh, adjustments in this situation, part of it involves property that the town owns in the county. Uh, that was contiguous that we we're going to work the boundary around part of it is um, to there's some subdivisions that are split that we're going to be able to put uh, in the same uh, jurisdiction uh, there are there are also um, folks who are town customers water uh, sewer utility customers uh, that will be able to be moved over uh, and, and it was a matter of uh, the last part of it and I'm, I'm, I can picture it in my head, but describing it <laughs> is, is more difficult. But uh, there's an area that um, the town will be able to develop more fully from the standpoint of counties, as you know, in Virginia don't build roads. And there are some roads that need to be upgraded, areas that need to have roads put in that is part of this uh, that the town will be able to handle. Uh, we, we can't do that because VDOT does that. and. and uh, the town's in a better position to do it. So we think it's a, a, uh, an agreement that would uh, both uh, enhance uh, a lot of the citizens' property as well as their opportunities, uh, and at the same time, uh, hopefully, put us in a position where there'll be more development, which would mean uh, more tax dollars both for the county and the town. All right. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone? Well, first, before we go to that, anyone have any questions for Mr. Gwynn? If not, I'll open the floor for public comment. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to speak on this? Uh, Van Dome Hughes. We'll state your name and address for the record, please, Mr. Muse. Sir? State your name and address for the record, please. I will. Uh, my name is Vandal Muse. I am a retired pastor after 37 years, uh, former moderator of the Pig River Missionary Baptist Association, and uh, I came to talk to you about the annexing of the Holland Hill area. Now, there's a there's quite a few people over there. It's about a hundred and some families that still building over there in that area. And my concern is that some of the people that live over there, they're old, retired, they're just living off of Social Security, and I don't think that they're going to be able, they're not, not going to be able with what they're getting on Social Security to pay a double tax. 
Uh, also, this is my not, not my first ro rodeo. I've been in here before, and I talked to y'all about building another exit. We only have one exit, and it's across the railroad track. And that's just a catastrophe to be, to happen at, at some time or another. It might not be in my lifetime, but it, sometime or another, something's going to happen, and those people are going to be blocked in over there. We don't need an emergency uh, way out. We need a street to get out from over there and uh, if uh, something comes up. I would hate to have it, you know, to, to have it uh, that some people over there might not be able to get around, this and that and the other, who was catch fire over there or something like that, or the train was wrecked over there. It would be impossible if it, if it was blocked, if our driveway was blocked, the street was blocked, to get out from over there. So I'm asking, I don't know whether y'all gonna annex it or not ask. I'd rather not, I'd rather that it wouldn't be annexed. But if you, you all decide to do it, I'm gonna ask you a question when you build us another exit out of that. I think it's only right that we should have another exit out of that. It's a mighty poor groundhog ain't got but one hole. And uh, we, need, we need something done about that. And we also, I'm, I'm speaking for the, tack, the, the people that live on there, live on the hill, that don't uh, have the, the finances to probably pay two taxes, and somebody's going to lose their homes behind that, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want that to happen. I'm not worried about that for myself, but it's for the people over there. Uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm uh, uh, disabled. And uh, I don't have to worry about paying property taxes. That's one thing I don't have to worry about doing. But I am, I am so... Well, I know it. I hear you beeping. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 we need to really do something about the people over there. And I think it would be a good idea if we didn't have uh, the annex. It's quiet, nice, people nice. Thank no you, problem. Mr. Muse. Amen. So can I get an answer? No, sir. This is not a two-way conversation. This is a public. This is a time for the public to speak. Oh, okay. The board okay. doesn't speak at this. Now, when, when can we get an answer? Uh, I think the town's going to meet on this later on, so the okay, their thanks. final decision. Thomas Young. Okay. Mr. Young, if you will state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Thomas Michael Young, 60 Belmont Drive, Rocky Mount, which is in the Tanglewood Hills subdivision. I am not really in favor of this annexation, and I don't really understand the reason for these particular parcels of land being selected to be annexed, particularly in regards to the um, reason that it was given in the statements published on the website under why are the town and county proposing a boundary line adjustment it says there is also an issue of equity or fairness people that live just outside the town limits typically enjoy and receive many sometimes all of the benefits of town services but they do not pay town taxes this means that existing town residents and businessmen essentially subsidize town service for all of those that are living outside of town limits, a situation that can be argued is unfair for town residents and businesses. Frankly, I'm insulted by this statement because I, as a resident of Tanglewood Hills, outside in the county part, not the town part, have been paying a higher water rate and sewer rate for almost 40 years. So the town, to me, seems to have benefited by me being on town water and paying a higher rate than town residents. And if the logic 
of the annexation is to make it fairer for the residents of town to uh, not have to subsidize me anymore as a moocher off of town. Um, I don't see why other parts of the county that have access to town water are not being annexed also. So I need a better explanation as to why these particular parcels are being annexed. Also, in the statement, there's another part that is not accurate. Uh, for example, many people that currently live outside of town limits in Tanglewood Hills or Diamond Avenue, Circle View Street, Highland Hills Road cannot get out of their neighborhood without driving on streets that are maintained by the town. I do not know about these others. I only know about Tanglewood Hills. When I moved in in 1985, there were no roads in the Tanglewood Hills subdivision in the town of Rocky Mount. You entered off of Scufflin Hill Road into the block I live on, which is entirely in the county. So if you're putting out statements about reasons for annexation and you have things that aren't tr accurate in there, I think you need to investigate and explain a little more about why you're annexing. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is Ben, and I, I can't make out the last name. Pinkert. <laughs> ben Pinkert. That's your name, Ben, for the record. Benjamin L. Pinkert, Sr., 125 Riverview Street, Rocky Mountain. It's been a long time since I've appeared before an August body like this, but I, I've got a little information here. I might approach the the council, a board, excuse me. This is your map of the proposed annex and boundary adjustment. That's what's familiar. It says in A, there's a total of $82,000. B, $583,600. C, $237,100. D, $124,424,700. E, $8,449,300. F, $305,000. G, $5,800. For a total of one hundred and thirty four million eighty seven thousand seven hundred. That's a lot of it. Well the mayor says it's one hundred and fifty nine thousand six hundred. Go ahead back to the mic so we can, everybody can hear you please. Pardon? Go ahead back to okay. the mic so everyone can hear you. There's one hundred and fifty nine thousand six hundred according to the mayor. Y'all say 134,087,700. Well, I say 39,904,100 is all the real estate in that whole annexed boundary adjustment. There's another one we got. This is a diamond down here extension. What do y'all see? What do y'all see here? Tell what you see. I don't see anything. 25 million and so many dollars. Go back to the mic, please. Uh oh, I'll be loud enough for everybody here. $25,637,900 in all of that huge area. Would y'all expect us to 
Thank you. To supply sewer, all the amenities, the town of Rocky Mount, $32,500 worth of revenue a year, nothing there. You know, I don't, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit perturbed about the mayor. I want to know where he got $159,600 worth of new tax revenue, uh, tax base. When it's 39 million. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Pinker. Your, Pardon time, me? your, your time's up. Thank you for your comments. Been up already? Well, I was going to crack down on y'all on the sewer plant. <laughs> y'all screwing us on the sewer plant, too. Uh, thank you for your comments. You'll leave us 400,000 gallons to growth in Rocky Mount of all kinds if the sewer plant thing goes through. 400,000 gallons. We get to 94%, we get to probably a 10 to $15 million expansion. We're getting screwed. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Pinker. Next speaker, please. I have no further speakers signed up. Okay. Is there anyone else here in the gallery tonight that would like to speak in regard to this? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the floor to public comment. Board, what's your pleasure? speak at once I'll just have a couple comments uh, I wish we could have heard the rest of mr. Pinkard's comments I think there's a lot of valid information there that's going to be more detrimental to the town which I represent versus the county uh, mr. Muse as far as your comments if this does go through, it would be up to the town to build that road. That's, that's one reason for this annexation is to get it into one body so you all can get an in or an out. So I would recommend that you show up at the town council meeting and, and talk to them about the road if this goes through. For me personally, I wish that the... Uh, fire truck had been separated out from this as one entity so that we could put that to rest and then move forward with the rest of this but it didn't work out that way so my vote when it comes to a vote is going to be for the funding of the fire truck is the main main thing for me and I, I don't know what the rest of you all think anyone else Okay, board, do I have a motion? I'll make the motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I move that the Board of Supervisors of Franklin County approve the boundary adjustment agreement with the Town of Rocky Mount and authorize the County Administrator and County Attorney to execute it and proceed to obtain approval of the agreement by the Circuit Court of Franklin County. And before we vote, could we have Mr. Jim or the county, uh, Gwen or the county administrator explain to the public how this is going to play out once we vote on it here tonight? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second on this motion? Okay, we have a second by Mr. Jamison. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion before we take a final vote? I'm happy to respond to Mr. Carter. Uh, you want to respond or you want us to finish the I'd vote like first. For him to, to explain to the audience before we vote okay how this will all play out if it passes both the county and the town 
Go ahead, Mr. Quinn. If, if both the town and the county pass the uh, boundary adjustment agreement, uh, there will then be uh, notice given to all the properties that are uh, affected by uh, the boundary adjustment. Uh, that notice will include a copy of a petition to the court to uh, uh, approve the boundary adjustment uh, since it's been done by agreement. Uh, those who have received um, the notice, I think the statute says that if one, if one third uh, of that group decides that they uh, want to make an appearance or whatever, uh, then there'll be a full-fledged hearing that's held on it. Um, and uh, then it'll be up to a judge to decide whether or not uh, to approve the, uh, the agreement. Okay. All right. With that said, is there any other discussion before we take a final vote? Okay, Madam Clerk, will you take, do a roll call, please? <clears throat> Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Supervisor Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. Um, and Chairman Thompson is absent for the vote. All right. Okay, moving along. Uh, do we have any uh, committee appointments by any board members? Oh, the one that we were given, uh, it's in the Boone District, so Ron is not here. Um, did the rest of y'all see this, this one? Yes. Agent Services? I did see that. Is, is, is there a vacancy? No? Okay, there's not a vacancy for it. Okay, so we can set that aside. All right, anyone else have any committee uh, assignments before we move on? Mr. Chairman, I would just, um, I, I'm going to have a slot for Gills Creek on the Planning Commission, okay. uh, effective January 1. So I will be in search of a replacement for that seat. And if anyone is, wants to express an interest, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. Okay, anyone else have anything before we go to public comment? <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached a time set aside in our meeting for public comment. Public comment gives citizens an opportunity to address the board in person or in writing on matters appropriate to the responsibilities of the board. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes for their comments. Speakers must direct all comments to the board as a whole and not to individual board members or employees of the board or county. Personal attacks or insulting, profane, or vulgar language will not be tolerated. Likewise, commentary on issues that are not within the purview of the board and that are not a function of local government and over which this board has no control are not acceptable. Public comment is a, not a question and answer session, and board members will not answer questions during public comment. If a speaker violates these rules, the chair may rule the speaker out of order and upon a second violation, have the speaker removed from the podium. Madam Clerk, we have anyone signed up for this? Mr. Keith Johnson. Okay, Mr. Johnson. State your name and address for the record, please, as soon as you get through passing those out. My name is Keith Johnson. I live at 190 Leaning Oak Road in Boone's Mill. I'm here tonight. I've been here a few times to talk about pornography in our uh, local schools. At the school board meeting last night, I heard talk about the $70 million capital improvement fund for the Career Technical Education Building. They talk about it as though it's a done deal. They are not considering alternatives based on what I heard last night. Correct me if I'm wrong. It appears the plan is to increase taxes to fund the CTE building for public schools that has declining enrollment and continue the politically motivated ideology to collect, store, and make available to our children books with vulgar stories about sex. Please don't do this. You are the leaders of our community. Please use your leverage uh, for positive change in our schools. Uh, you don't lose your rights as a citizen when you're elected. You have the right and obligation, in my opinion, to express to the school board your displeasure with their 
pushing immoral sexual attitudes onto our children. On a side note, did you know that the two high school librarians quit their job? Would you want to keep that job if you were required to read and approve these vulgar books? Also, I held a book in my hand used by the elementary school that had entire pages blocked so children could not read the inappropriate material. Teachers are likely doing this, good for them. But why did they not take the issue to administration? Or maybe they did and this is their response. Should school get everything they want? What is the school administration willing to give up to obtain the $70 million in a tax increase? You have every right to require a report from the school board with details of their research and proposals for how they plan uh, to stop the trend of parents removing their children from the public school system, increase enrollment, and create an environment where parents will want to return their children to public school. Why can't this be something they have to provide? I heard at a public meeting school officials saying the state is going to require high school students to have a CTE class before they can graduate. I found this difficult to believe. I hope you require the school board to provide this state requirement in writing to you before you use this as a motivating factor for the new building. The school put off further discussion by removing pornography of the school uh, until they survey parents about their satisfaction with library services. This will be their excuse to keep pornography in the school, in my judgment. We have worked to develop a survey of Franklin County taxpayers to ask whether they want their taxes used to support pornographic books in the school. The Excel file I received from the Commissioner of Revenue contains 88,000 entries. Filtering out duplicate entries, businesses, out-of-county addresses, and other measures, we have that file down to about 19,400 addresses in Franklin County. The cost of print materials, stuff envelopes, and postage is $11,000. I'm hoping to get donations to help pay for this survey. So far, I have commitments of a few thousand. If you or anyone you know wants to help remove the porn from the schools and make a contribution to this survey, please let me know. My phone number's on the uh, handout. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, that's all I have signed up. Okay. Do we have anyone here that did not sign up that would like to address the board? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the floor to public comment. And moving on to other matters for supervisors. I will start over here to my immediate left with Mr. Jamison. Do you have anything? The um, only thing I'd like to say is voting time. I urge everybody to get out and vote. It's important election. Mm -hmm. Okay, going to my right, I'm going to come back over here. I'm coming over here to Mr. Quinn. No, I'm all set. Okay. I see that Mr. Mitchell stepped out, so Mr. Carter. I don't have anything tonight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Ms. Smith? I'm going to hold mine. You what? I'm going to hold mine, so I have nothing for now. Okay. Did Mr. Mitchell leave, uh, or yeah, he, okay, he said he had to check out? Okay. I just have one thing uh, in lieu of the recent storms that have hit part of our state and North Carolina and Tennessee and then the other storms and possibility of having more coming up. I would like, I think we need to get with public safety and the sheriff's department and review our uh, critical incident uh, policy and procedures as far as uh, critical incident plan. Uh, I don't know when the last time it was updated, but I do not want to see us get caught. That storm so easily could have come, you know, further east, and, and, and we, we could have seen massive da damage. So I don't want to see us get caught with our hands uh, thrown up in the air not knowing what to do. So let's, let's get together and uh, put together a plan. I know we have one. Let's see how it needs to be updated see what we need to do to, to make it more uh, things we need to consider. Do we have enough shelters in the county? If there's a mass power outage, do we have enough shelters throughout the county? Um, do, you know, how, how can we assure basic necessities you know, from, from our standpoint? Uh, and maybe we're the lucky county in the region, but maybe our neighbor, one of our neighbors gets hit hard and we want to be available to, to assist our neighbors as well. So, I'm just throwing that out there, something for future discussion, Mr. Carter. You, you kind of sparked something I was thinking about the other day, and that's the water treatment plant. 
sits right on the banks of the Blackwater River within, I don't know, 100 yards or less. And uh, I don't know if that's our responsibility or the town, but that needs to be looked at as potential mitigation if there was a disastrous flood. I know, I think we're tired into that new water line, but I don't know if it goes to that plant or bypasses it, but that should be looked at. Mm -hmm. If I may, Mr. Chairman, um, excellent um, thoughts and so forth regarding um, local emergency operations planning. We are required by code of Virginia to have an emergency operations plan. We do, uh, and it, it has been updated in recent years, but it's not to say with re recent events and a lot of national attention on local emergencies. Um, so what, what we can do, uh, certainly I, I think as a board to assist, and I was sharing with the chairman earlier, I don't think anyone prior to tw 2019 thought that Franklin County would ever experience an F3 tornado, uh, and we did. Uh, and so um, when that happens, uh, we, we declare local emergencies and, and our emergency operations plans put in place. We have our emergency operations center here in the building now. Uh, it was recently relocated. Um, we have a very active local emergency planning committee. That includes the towns of Boone's Mill and Rocky Mount. Uh, it also includes the water wastewater treatment plant, Mr. Carter, that you mentioned. In addition, the local health department, Salvation Army. There's a lot of those things, but it's a reminder to me um, that the governing body often is not necessarily involved in these local emergency planning committee meetings. So, um, Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. Tatum, to your point, uh, we certainly could get information out to the board about our emergency operations plan, but even a step further, um, maybe a review of that uh, would be helpful at some point with, with, with our local board um, for you as, as the locally elected board of supervisors to, to hear about that, and we can work with our public safety director and, and emergency staff to pull, pull that maybe a session together for the board at a future board meeting. Absolutely. I, you know, I, we, I would hate for, you know, a year from now, storm come through and we get hammered and we say, boy, I wish we had planned better. You know, if we'd only known that we needed, you know, six sites to where people could go for, you know, water, you know, whether it's fire departments or schools or what for shelters, we need to make sure that one, if we identify this location as a shelter, make sure that location has what it needs to, survive, to supply the people that may call on it. Because it's no good to send the, tell people, okay, if you live in Glade Hill, you can go to Glade Hill Fire Department for you know a hot shower, hot food, whatever, and then we don't have the resources there. We need to make sure that we don't get caught flat-footed on this. But thank you, and, and yeah. that's something we need. Let's let's jump on that, and uh, and you know all the entities, the sheriff, uh, public safety, uh, town of Rocky Mount, the school system, uh, you know, uh, water and sewer, uh, landfill. I mean, there's there's roles for for there's plenty of roles to go around, and I, I just want to make sure we don't because I know a lot of these localities. I know Eric was just telling us earlier, you know, their guys went down and helped places in North Carolina. I'm sure those localities never dreamed that they would have seen. I mean, I've been through Chimney Rock years ago. It's no longer there. And, you know, that's, you know, you can't plan for everything, but if you don't plan, you know, the old saying, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Let's make sure that we don't fall into that. Thank you. Anybody have anything before we wrap it up? We need to go into closed session, so I will have uh, Supervisor Smith to read the motion, please. I will, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, thank you. I would move that the Franklin County Board of Supervisors enter into closed meeting in accordance with Section 2.2-3711A1, personnel discussion of appointments to county boards, commissions, et cetera, A, Three, discussion of the acquisition of real property or the disposition of real property. A5, discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry. A7, consultation with legal counsel on briefings by staff about litigation or other specific matters requiring legal advice. A29, discussion of the terms of a public contract of the Code of Virginia as amended. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Madam Clerk, you take a roll call, please. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Supervisor Mitchell is absent. 
Um, Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. And Chairman Thompson is absent for the vote. All right. We will reconvene. Y'all want to go back to ARC or B-75?